We're a minute after the hour. Do we have everyone with us? Do we have quorum? Let me. We have a sizable amount. Let me count really quick. <laughs> it's hard to say. Um, um. I, I think we do have quorum, Bonache. Okay. You want me to start and um, do roll call, and then we can, as people join. Yeah, and then and then we could go into the rest of it. Um, okay. Selena just made a, a, a quick comment here in the chat room that she's stepping away just in case for a roll call, but she is here. I'm sorry, Duan. And then Judge Jaskol just said um, she's tried the star six, but it's it's not unmuting mm -hmm. on her end. Um, Kim, could, could you could you try to unmute Judge Askell? She was having tech issues at partnership. Okay, I'm a, I'll I'll try. I was just also can I ask that you or one of the other uh, OAI staff do the Zoom information while I um, promote people and help Judge Jaskell? Yeah, that's she, great. Yeah, uh, if someone could do the ground rules. If Dan, would would you mind? Uh, <clears throat> not at all. I, I don't uh, have them uh, written out oh. in front of me. But... Erica's on. Er Erica, er Erica, do you mind? Thank you. I've got the, the roll sheet and the PowerPoint, a couple other screens juggling. I can do go ahead and do it too, Dawn. I have oh, it in okay. front of me. Oh, thank you so much, Crystal. Yeah, no problem. So I welcome uh, commission members, liaisons, and members of the public to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission meeting. Thank you for joining us. We are using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please type, I have a question. Um, in the chat and a message will be sent to the hosts. Alternatively, you can use the raise hand feature. In efforts of transparency for all those joining this public meeting, whether by phone or in Zoom, we request that you refrain from having side conversations on chat about the content of the meeting. Again, the chat features utilized simply as a tool for you to virtually indicate that you'd like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. I note that all um, Legal Services Trust Fund Commission and committee meetings will be recorded and posted on the State Bar website. Uh, friendly reminder that this is a video conference and to please be aware of your surroundings behind you. A few troubleshooting tips um, for those using Zoom on a computer when on mute, holding down the space bar will tempor temporarily unmute you. If, your phone, uh, if you use your phone to dial into this meeting, please be sure your computer's microphone is on mute to avoid audio feedback issues. And while joining audio via computer is highly recommended, if an individual loses audio, you can call in separately using the Zoom conference number. If I could just add one more, um, if you're not speaking, please uh, keep yourself on mute just to help with background noise. Thank you. Shall we go on to uh, roll call? Um, and, and good afternoon, everyone. For um, uh, folks that don't know me, my name is Dawan Nguyen. I'm a program supervisor in the Office of Access and Inclusion, and welcome to today's um, Legal Services Trust Fund Commission meeting. So I'll do roll call vote. Um, Banashe Aglagi? Yes, here. Eric Iskin? Yes, present. Amin Al Saraf? Mm -hmm. Amin, did, did I hear you? Yes, I'm here. Can you, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, thank you, Amin. Um, Kim Bartelson? Here. Luis Bayless Fightmeister? Here. Pamela Bennett? Here. Catherine Blakemore? Here. Will Bashelli? Here. Erica Connolly? Here. Herman Du Bois? Present. Rebecca Delfino? Rebecca Delfino? Corey Friedman? Corey Friedman? Zahira Mann? Here. Professor Meeker? Here. Deborah Myers? Bob Plantel? Here. Rich Rhinus? Here. Kim Savage? Here. Christian Schreiber? Here. Christina Venerelli? Here. 
Judge Yasko? Is Judge Yasko still having um, audio issues? He's unmuted. I'm not sure why she can't can't talk. Judge Yasko, can you hear us? Or can can you? <laughs> oh, she's she's back on mute. Um, Kim, perhaps call IT, but um, our marker is here for now. Justice Murray. Here. Judge Seligman. Here. <clears throat> We have quorum on um, Banache, so I, I'll um, move on to doing a uh, roll call for the uh, liaisons and presenters. Selena Copeland. Present. Bonnie Huff. Present. Christine Gonan. Present. And then state bar staff. Andrea Fatanides. Andrea, you on? I thought I saw you. He's on. I'm, they're all unmuted. I'm not sure why they they're not Can talking. Not okay, oh, I'm here. So, you now. So quiet. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Elizabeth Holm. Here. Brady Dewar. Here. Christine Holmes. Here. Crystal Bolding. Here. Erica Carroll? Here. Dan Passamenic? Here. And we have a special guest with us, um, Jeff Ball, who's not officially on the commission yet, but I, th I think I saw I saw Jeff. Jeff, are you still yes. there? Welcome yes, I am here. here. Thank you. Um, and are there any members of the public who would like to introduce yourself right now? Well, we do have a, a, a liaison from COAP as well, do we not? Yes. Um, this is Ryan Harrison. I'm the vice chair of COAF. Hi, Ryan. Welcome. Hi. Are there any other members of the public who would like to introduce yourself? There's another person that's calling in from a 510-684-2633 number. And, and Carolina, I think I saw you too. I'm sorry I missed you earlier. Are there any other members of the public that would like to introduce yourself? Okay, Bonisha, I'll hand it over um, back over to you for public comments. Great, thank you, Duan. Um, do we have any members of the public for public comments? Okay, hearing none. Um, then first and foremost, I wanna welcome all of you to our first meeting of 2020-2021 uh, term. Uh, you probably are feeling like we're more probably in 2025, given how this year has been going. It's um, like dog years in my world. It keeps on, keeps on uh, giving. Uh, we usually have this meeting um, as our last meeting of our term, but uh, we've included an additional meeting in December for uh, approval of our um, homelessness prevention grants. So we're uh, changing the calendar a bit this year. Uh, if you've uh, noticed, there are some additional faces, some new faces, um, some old faces who are joining us. Um, I'd like to first take the opportunity to uh, warmly welcome and introduce our new director of the Office of Access and Inclusion. Andrea is here with us. Um, if you can send out a, a, a a quick hello. Um, just a little bit about Andrea. You all have received her bio at this point, but I wanted to highlight um, some of her accomplishments and as, as to uh, why she's the perfect fit um, for this time in this office. Uh, she served as pro bono counsel for Morgan Lewis. And in that role, she led the firm's pro bono program in California, in Texas, and through their European offices. And she fostered deep relationships um, with partner uh, legal services organizations. So she really has a background within the legal services uh, space. She's, uh, she increased 
uh, Morgan Lewis's pro bono participation to reduce the justice gap resulting in an award-winning uh, pro bono program um, and 100% attorney participation across the firm. And these are just some of what her accomplishments are and uh, just really Welcome, Andrea. We are excited to have you lead this office. Um, we needed the leadership, so it's uh, exciting to have you with us. Uh, and you'll hear more from Andrea during the meeting today. And I'd love to introduce um, a new commission member, uh, Catherine Blakemore. Uh, hello. Uh, many of you probably know Catherine. Uh, she comes to us with just deep knowledge and experience in legal services. Um, she's familiar with the access to, to, to justice issues and her entire legal career is focused on representing and securing justice for indigent Californians. Um, you may know her work uh, from three different legal aid organizations until her retirement where she served as executive director of disability rights in California which is an IOLTA funded organization. And we're excited to be working with you and uh, tapping into that knowledge. So welcome, Catherine. And um, Jeff Ball, it took a, it took a, a bit of um, begging on my part. <laughs> and uh, I, I left some, I guess, uh, some of it on the floor, as they said, and, help, and getting Jeff to come back. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know Jeff, uh, Jeff was on this commission um, with us in 2009 through 2013, and um, his experience in the financial sector helped us get through uh, that financial uh, um, episode in our history. And so I personally, and, and I know the, the rest of you as you begin to speak with him and get to know him, for those of you who don't know him yet, are going to be uh, so thrilled that we have his extensive banking and finance experience. Um, he has led high profile positions at various financial institutions throughout California and Orange County specifically. Um, he's the founder of Friendly Hills Bank, where he's currently uh, serving as its president and CEO. Um, and the list goes on in, in terms of Jeff's background. So really excited to have um, you three as additions uh, as we're, we're embarking upon this new term. And um, just a bit more, if I may, uh, we have been listening to commission members. We've been having phone calls with you. Um, and one of the one of the things that we've heard from commission members, um, and in particular um, for the two of us, Eric and I, on the executive committee, is you know we're um, there's there's a lot of work, right? And so um, that, along with the fact that we used to have an executive committee that had um, a chair and a co-chair in Southern California and a chair and co-chair in Northern California. Um, we, that was changed last year. And um, this year, we, we, as I said, we've heard what you all have said. And we asked the Board of Trustees uh, to revive the XCOM as we used to have it with the two and two um, in, be, in each jurisdiction. Uh, and at this point, it's before uh, their November meeting, which happens after this meeting. Uh, and we have asked them and they are, uh, they have, they're looking at uh, recommending to the full uh, board of trustees, the, the recommendation of um, including Eric uh, Iskind as my co-chair after this uh, this last this this meeting, and Ch uh, Kim Savage and Rich Ryan's as our co vice chairs, and with that change, uh, we are hoping to be able to um, continue the strategic thinking and uh, leadership as we go through these these challenging times. Um, and I will end all of my uh, my updates there, but it's uh, exciting. Uh, with the new folks coming on and the robustness of the executive committee. So um, if there aren't any questions or comments, I will uh, move on to um, 
approving the, meet, the meeting minutes from the August 14th, 2020 meeting. So moved. Do I have a second? I'm sorry, who was that that moved? I, I, I believe that was Bob. Bob Planthold. Okay, hi, Bob. Second. That's I'll Deborah. Second. Oh, sorry, didn't hear you. I'm sorry, who seconded now? All right, yeah. Deborah. Thank you, Deborah. Great. And I could do a roll call vote. Please. Bonachet? Yes. Eric? Eric? Eric Iskin, are you still there? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Amin? Yes. Kim Bartleson? I was not in attendance at the meeting. I'll abstain. Thank you. Luis? Yes. <clears throat> Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Abstain. Will? Yes. Erica? Yes. Herman? Yes. Rebecca? Corey? Zahira? Um, I, I, I'm, I know this is a little out of order, but I just had a comment on this one because there's a typo within the minutes, I believe. Oh, sure. Can you let us know? We can do a friendly amendment. OK, great. Um, so I think it's on page six. Um, there's a, ref a reference that says further resolved um, that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission approved the timeline for the distribution of $31 homeless oh, prevention. Oh, be 31. <laughs> Sorry about that. So with that a, a, amendment, yes. Thank you for that. Jim? Yes. Deborah? Abstain. I, I don't think I was at that meeting. I'm sorry, I'm checking my notes now. Okay, that's that's fine, Deborah. Bob? Bob, are you still there? Hello, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Rich? Yes. Kim Savage? Kim Savage? Chris? Yes. Christina? Yes. Counting only the yeses I heard, we, we do have uh, the motion passing. Hold on, I'm counting. Dan, let me give you a number. Sorry, I have to count, recount you. Hold on. Do you have 14, Dan? I do. Okay, great. Motion passes, Monashe. Great, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, so um, we're gonna take a few of these agenda items out of order um, based on uh, people's availability. Um, so let me turn to 12A and welcome Ryan Harrison, who is the vice chair of COAF. Just a little bit of background for all of you. Um, I've mentioned this uh, before. Last year, um, I had the good pleasure of reaching out to Judge Brenda, who was COAF's chair, um, and Judge Esther, who at the time was COAF's vice chair and is now COAF's chair. And as you know, COAF is the Kind of the, the, the other side of the same coin as the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission in the, in the Office of Access and Inclusion. And um, one of the, the thoughts that we had was to look to see how best we could work together, given that the idea was to bring these two organizations together under one umbrella and have them um, inform the other. So uh, COAF with its policy informing our grant making and our grant making informing policy and so on. And so given that the staff is, is working in, in both spaces, uh, literally simultaneously, they're, they're carrying loads on, uh, in both uh, spaces, we thought it would be a good idea to um, have COAF and the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission also get to know each other's work. So um, I was, um, 
I was invited and welcomed to their meeting, um, their last meeting, and uh, we've extended the same invitation, warm invitation, uh, for Ryan and um, Judge Esther to, to come speak with us. Uh, Judge Esther wasn't available, uh, but Ryan, who is their vice chair, and um, congratulations, uh, and being vice chair of COAF this year, Ryan, is here to speak with us, and he also has a, an additional liaison report as well. So I'm going to turn it over to you. And um, welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Benafe. Um, hello, members. Appreciate the work you do with regard to the Legal Services Trust Fund. Um, COAF is the sub-entity of the State Bar that operationalizes the legislature's mandate that the State Bar um, take measures to diversify the legal profession. And uh, that is what we are doing. We consist of a broad array of diverse attorneys and judges that represent the rich diversity of our state. And we're sort of a think tank, but we're also uh, heavily engaged in community service to advance the diversity initiative. Um, a few of the things that we've been doing uh, as of late, uh, one of them is the diversity report card that we publish an annually. And that report card, uh, updates the legal sector and its stakeholders on the current status with respect to um, diversity in the legal profession and provides an analysis of how we can get to where we want to be on that front. Uh, we're also currently engaged in a, a media project, which was um, graciously approved by the Board of Trustees, where we are interviewing uh, diverse attorneys who practice in sort of non-traditional um, legal areas um, so that maybe we can ins inspire our youth and uh, maybe students in, in undergrad um, to want to become attorneys. And uh, our first interview project happened to take place about uh, three weeks ago at the new Chase Center Arena. We interviewed David Kelly, who's the general counsel of the Golden State Warriors. Um, and uh, we're probably going to interview next Heather Anderson, who is also a member of COAF and is counsel for Disney. And another uh, person in our pipeline is Matt Valdez, who is a associate general counsel with the San Francisco Giants. And the idea is to merge things that are cool um, to kids like sports um, with legal practice to kind of stimulate and prime them to think that becoming an attorney is something that's for them and so that they can engage in a, um, in a curious pursuit as to what that looks like for them. Um, another thing that we've been working on uh, and that we do every year is the Di Diversity Summit, where we bring in legal industry stakeholders um, and we talk about the diversity report card and we educate them on things that they can do in their sector to help bring along the diversity issue. And um, this last year, or this year, we actually broke up the Diversity Summit into two separate summits, one for the nonprofit sector and the other for the private sector. Um, one other thing that we're doing is that we serve as liaisons to outside organizations like California Law, which focuses on uh, various law academies in the high school uh, realm, and the California Lawyers Association, which is obviously the trade association for us. And um, shifting gears, um, there are a couple of things that I have been informed that you guys are doing that we might be able to work together on. Uh, one is the, the, the justice gap study. Uh, I think that you guys are still working on that, but maybe there is a, a way that, that COAF could, could team up with you guys and, and help you guys find a solution to help facilitate your goal in that regard. And the other thing is um, the um, recruitment and retention study uh, for the legal aid community. And uh, I've been informed that a lot of attorneys um, in their fifth, you know, sixth, seventh or eighth year um, end up, you know, leaving or, or um, not, not continuing to be involved in the, um, in the legal aid community because of, because of a variety of issues and maybe um, members of COAP can provide input on, on that front and, and help you guys achieve your goals in that regard. Um, and I think there's also a focus on, on legal internships uh, while students are in college and in law school as well. So um, those type of things that I think we can work together on, and I'm sure maybe you guys have ideas of, of, of other things as well. And you know, I'm here extending a um, bridge of communication so that uh, we can team up and work together and accomplish these goals in order to do some good work. And it's nice to meet you all. Thank you for the time.
Thank you very much, Ryan, for taking the time and coming uh, to speak with us. I'm just going to open it up to the commission members here. If you have any questions or comments for Ryan, Herman, please. Yes, uh, I welcome and thanks for coming. I'm on the bank rank committee, and one of the issues that was raised by, raised by one of our members that um, legal aid found legal aid organizations are generally understaffed. And part of that understaff is related to salaries that individuals who are lawyers and non lawyers have difficulty. Those organizations have difficulty competing with private and public sector organizations in relationship to salary. So when I hear you say that that's one of the areas that you are going to look into, I'm very pleased to hear that because these organizations, it appears to me, will not be able to compete if they don't have adequate salaries to hire people and maintain people. So I just wanted to say thanks for talking about that particular issue. Thank you so much. Thank you, Herman. Uh, anyone else on the commission have a question or a comment for Ryan? I'm toggling through. So if there's anyone, you can just speak right up. Okay, um, it looks like uh, everyone is uh, is taking in everything you had to say, Ryan. Thank you so much. This really is the beginning. Um, I think it's a it's a great way for us to uh, find ways to merge efforts and resources, and that way it also supports the staff um, in terms of their work. And um, yeah, this is the beginning. So thank you so much for all the great work you guys are doing there um, on Council on Access to Fairness. And say hello right. to Judge Esther for us. Will do. All right, you guys. Uh, I am heading out to take care of some legal work. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Bye-bye. Uh, okay, so let's turn to uh, Rules Committee. I know that um, Amin needs to drop off by 1.30, so I'll uh, hand it over to Dwan, Erica, and Amin to take it from here. I mean, do you, do you want to talk about the work plan and update? And then Erica and I can talk about the substantive um, update. Sure. Thank you, Panache, for, for allowing us to leapfrog. Um, hello, everyone. I, you, you may have seen in the materials the updated uh, Rules Committee work plan. And I, I just want to address kind of generally first um, something that came up. And I think just to sort of clarify for folks that um, are, are working on working groups right now. We are, you know, we took a little bit of a hiatus to, to reassess um, timing, you know, what the landscape was gonna look like. And then we, we sort of restarted the process of going through um, <clears throat> the various topics that we have to work through. Um, and for those of you who are new to this, to the commission, what, what our committee is doing is taking a look at some, some of the, the rules and regulations that have applied to the, to the work that we've been doing. Um, some of it is very specific, some of it a little bit more broad-based to um, add a little bit of um, clarity in some cases, in other cases to um, reassess or at least address um, sort of broad policy issues so that the rules that are applicable to um, you know, for example, what uh, eligible or qualifying work is, what what is, you know, how we define certain things such as civil legal services and, and things of that nature that affect um, the amount and the eligibility of, of organizations to get funds uh, through IOLTA, for example. Um, it, it's a it's a rather large undertaking, um, and it's something that we uh, and staff has really dug deeply into. And I, I want to just sort of call out, you know. Duan and, and the rest of the staff that's invested a lot of time into this project. Um, it, it's been incredible. And, and what we decided to do towards the beginning of the, the, the committee's uh, existence was because there is a wealth of expertise and, and knowledge and, and sort of institutional knowledge uh, among the commission members, um, and because we didn't want this to be a a, a sort of pigeonhole project, which a few folks are working on for, in terms of commission members, we decided that it, would, it might make sense um, it, to 
create working groups that address each of these issues, working groups of, of commission members with, with the staff um, uh, dedicated to that working group as well. Um, commission members who are not necessarily a part of the rules committee so that we can garner as much input as possible from folks um, in, in the process of assessing these, these different issues. And then that working group reports back to the committee. The committee has a discussion um, and ultimately reaches a, a, um, a conclusion or at least a recommendation that will then come back to the commission and so uh, for, for a vote. And so I, I just wanted to, for those of you who are working on working groups, thank you for, for participating in that. Um, and in terms of sort of contextualizing what your role is, um, you know, the, the idea really is to, for you to participate in this fully and to give us and to give, you know, staff and the, and the committee members that are on the working group as well, um, as much feedback and input on the particular issues that you're working on as possible so that we can make as, as informed and as, you know, an intelligent uh, recommendation and, and, and proposal. So I, I know there was a little bit of maybe some confusion and some, some concern about um, the role. And so I hope that addresses it. Um, and I'll, I'll turn it back to Duan. Uh, and if there's any questions, you know, obviously, please feel free to either raise it now or, or reach out. And I guess I'll just add a little bit more context in that um, uh, um, our office and, and our, the grants administration is governed by a number of governing authorities, um, most notable the IOLTA statute. But there are also state bar rules that help inform um, our reading of the statute, as well as um, guidelines that were promulgated um, by the Trust, Trust Fund Commission. Over the years, um, there have been lots of office practices that have been adopted that aren't codified anywhere. Um, and because of the multiple kind of um, governing authorities, sometimes um, the office practice and the governing authorities conflict with one another um, and then layering on kind of the office practice. So as Amin said, this is, this is a large kind of undertaking um, to, to make our, our grant making more transparent and more consistent. Um, when we originally designed the work plan um, a year ago, um, we, we were hoping at first to start out with um, kind of less controversial issues. So um, we started out with kind of the audit requirement because we thought, you know, um, let's start out with something easy, something that's, you know, um, concrete um, while we, we try to figure out how to design the process. Even with the audit issue, um, there were at least three rules committee meeting. So then we took a step back um, and in consultation with Amin, um, we decided to rework the work plan and start out with really kind of foundational issues and then narrow in on some more of the more um, technical issues. Um, then COVID hit. And so we had to take a pause on, on, on the rules committee because a lot of the issues that we were starting out with um, really involved kind of deep thinking and community feedback. And we thought that it just wasn't appropriate at that time um, to, to, to engage the community in, in, given that they were in kind of crisis mode. So we took a, a six month pause. We resumed to work on the rules committee in, in October because we felt like you know this process is so important that um, we didn't, do, didn't want to go on hiatus too long. Um, so in October, um, we started out with um, two very important um, um, topics. Um, we um, dealt with um, uh, the primary purpose requirement um, for a qualified legal services project. We decided to hold off on support centers because support centers, um, it, it's, it's complicated and, and warranted um, you know, a deeper dive. So um, we, we looked at um, the primary purpose requirement um, for um, QSPs, um, you know, the, the, as you know, the statute requires um, QSPs um, to have a primary purpose of providing um, services to indigent um, uh, clients. Um, the state bar rules and the, the guidelines say that there is this 75% presumption. Over the years, the office practice um, has been to approve um, programs um, between the 50 and 75 percent qualified expenditures. So really the crux of, of that issue was um, do we want to codify that rule because um, codify the office practice because we've never um, not funded somebody um, below uh, in, in, in between the 50 and 75. But you know in, in, in kind of taking a deeper dive in that issue. Um, Crystal and our office was the lead staff. Um, it was it was just really connected to a lot of the other issues. So we have, there's a preliminary um, a recommendation from uh, the rules committee around uh, um, that requirement, but we're holding off on firming up um, that, that, that particular requirement. 
also at the October meeting, um, Erica is also working um, on a really specific issue um, that I'll turn it over to Erica um, to talk about more. Um, and and, and it's, it, it has a kind of a very wide kind of policy consideration. And that's why we want to take a little bit of a deeper dive on that one um, and share, share the results and the preliminary recommendations for that particular um, working group. Erica, would you like me to um, pull up the slides? Sure, that would be great. Let me share my screen. forward to here we go thanks um so as dawn mentioned the other issue that we've been working on um in the rules committee is defining and demonstrating indigency um and this has also been another topic that um where we started out is not where we've ended up thus far so if you could go to the next slide please um so the two main prongs that we identified when uh, first exploring this topic was clarifying the current definition of indigent person um, under the Business and Professions Code section 6213D. Um, that section has a number of different ways uh, that a person may be eligible for services as an indigent person um, by uh, having income at or below 125% of the federal poverty level, um, receiving um, certain benefits such as supplemental security income or being eligible for services uh, under the Older Americans Act or Developmentally Disabled Assistance Act. Um, there's a different income threshold for uh, qualified legal services projects that uh, receive a pro bono allocation, which I won't go into uh, in detail today, but that is um, a different threshold. And then um, uh, to allow organizations to deduct disability related expenses before calculating income. So we were looking at that current definition and ways to um, clarify it through a state bar rules so that um, organizations could be setting the same standards for their, um, their screening, uh, their income screening. And then the other issue that we identified was um, demonstrating indigency through the impact litigation and advocacy work reports that um, organizations um, report out on every year as part of their application process. So um, the statute is clear in terms of providing services to an individual, but when it comes to providing services on behalf of a group, um, there is no statute or state bar rule in existence. Uh, currently, it's only under our eligibility guidelines that we provide more guidance to programs about um, showing that the work they are doing is, is primarily on behalf of indigent persons. Um, and so we were um, exploring turning that into uh, a state bar rule and having um, clearer standards for that as well. Um, so these are all, all things that uh, the working group was discussing um, and is still working on. But if you could go to the next slide one. One thing we identified when we uh, started looking at the income eligibility threshold, we circulated a memo to the legal aid community and um, asked for their feedback and something that came back to us, which we hadn't initially um, offered, was a, um, a request to explore the possibility of changing the income threshold from 125% of the federal poverty level. Um, the request was to look into either raising it to potentially 200% of the federal poverty level, which would be in line with um, some other grantors, um, or to use the area median income, which is also another very common uh, standard for income eligibility. And it's more responsive to, uh, to differences um, uh, at a more local level, at the metropolitan level. So uh, what this chart is just showing you is that what the income threshold would be for a family size of four in 2020. So um, what the current threshold is, is 125%. So that's 32,750 for a family of four. Um, if the threshold were raised to 200%, it would be a little over 52,000. And then um, this is not an exhaustive list, but it's showing um, some of the other uh, area median income standards from, from a very low income bracket, which is 50% of the area median income uh, to the low income bracket, which is I believe 80% of the area median income. So um, these are just, uh, options that are under consideration. There hasn't been a decision made on that yet, um, but at the last rules committee meeting, um, when we discussed this issue, um, the, the direction from that committee was to, 
to explore uh, the possibility of making any of these changes and then to bring it back um, with a fuller analysis of what impact that would have on, um, you know, by county funding, whether this would potentially move, um, you know, more money into urban areas, if it would be taken away from rural counties, if it would not necessarily impact the distribution that much. Um, so we're still uh, currently in the process of uh, seeing how that, how that would work um, when we run uh, the funding formula. Um, and that's the other consideration is uh, we have the income eligibility threshold and then we have our funding formula, which is run at the same level, um, the population by county that's at or below 125% of the federal poverty level. That's a different statute, but it's the same same income level. And so we're looking at whether um, those two should still be uh, kind of matched up or running parallel or if there um, can be changes to the eligibility threshold while keeping the same standard for the funding formula. So. Okay, can I add a little bit more context as well? Yeah. Um, so, so two years ago, uh, when our office participated in the um, Legal Services Trust Fund um, stakeholder working group process, um, which uh, uh, Rich Rhinus and, and Corey from our um, from the commission participated, um, at that time we um, did a deep dive in whether um, there are parts of the IELTA statute that should be revisited and revised. And at that time, um, uh, um, it was a, kind of a, a unanimous in the community that maybe perhaps we should hold off. Um, there seemed to be some leaning of wanting to say, change just, uh, the statute and raise the income threshold, but there wasn't a great desire um, at that time um, to, to, to kind of open up the statute. Um, so, you know, we are very excited that um, we're at a point where there's a, an alignment um, to kind of make the statutory change um, because for the longest time in this office and the community has been talking about that the the, the 125 federal poverty um, level is just, it's, it's very low, it's outdated. It doesn't conform to what other funders are doing it, that we should raise it to at least um, 200%. So, so we are very excited um, to hear through Selena that um, there's support around this and we believe that um, you know if, if there's alignment um, that this would be a ripe time to move um, given the kind of the challenges brought on by COVID um, that this this would be an area that um, we can provide some flexibility to programs um, and some support to programs in terms of um, being able to assist uh, more clients. Um, we have um, been in communication um, with, with LAC, um, with executive staff um, to, to uh, figure out kind of a, a path forward and, and a plan of action. Um, so I'll, I'll move on to the um, second, next slide so that Eric can talk a little bit more about specifics. Um, yeah, so as I, as I mentioned at the last rules committee meeting, the, the decision was not to pursue a specific change at this point. It was uh, the direction given to staff was to to pursue a statutory change potentially, but to um, sort of survey all the possible options um, available so that the committee and the commission will ultimately be able to have a, a really in-depth discussion about the different um, ways this may play out and to avoid any unintended consequences so that it's an informed decision both um, you know, for the commission and uh, so that the legal aid community will be um, you know, uh, also informed uh, about what impact that may have on their funding streams. Um, so our next step after um, we kind of gather all this data, which we are in the midst of doing, is to uh, send out a survey to the legal aid community um, to get further input um, with these data points about how they feel about um, making any particular change, whether it's increasing uh, to 200% of the federal poverty level or using something um, a little bit more specific like the area median income. Um, the other thing that came out of the discussion was that, um, you know, we initially had recommended holding off on making any other changes uh, related to things like ILA or uh, the parts of the definition of indigent person that don't rely on income. Um, but we're also uh, looking into whether we can move forward with those changes because a statutory change may, um, may be sort of a, a long or uh, involved process. And so whether um, these other changes can move forward without um, necessarily needing to wait on on that particular uh, change. Great. Um, so we can run through a kind of a, a next steps. 
Um, so we, we received kind of anecdotal feedback um, through LAC that um, the community is in support of, of some type of increase. What exactly that increase is, um, you know, we, we still need to do the analysis within our office and then share that with the community um, and then gather additional um, feedback. And that's the survey that Erica was talking about. So in the next couple of weeks, um, Erica and I um, and some of the staff in the office, including Carolina, are working with our research department at the state bar um, to do the initial analysis. And, and Jim, Professor Meeker has been uh, really pivotal in this. Um, he's been consulting with us um, pretty much weekly on how to um, approach this. Um, we are, um, Erica and Jim have been working on kind of looking at um, uh, how the numbers play out in terms of eligibility, but we're engaging with our um, research um, uh, 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 department at the state bar um, for them to run the, for the IELTA formula based on AMI and the 200% um, so that we could see if there are any kind of distortions if we choose to um, uh, modify the formula as well. We, we don't have to. Um, and this was something that uh, at the rules committee, um, Judge Seligman made a really good point because I think uh, in terms of staff spirit, <laughs> mine, we were all thinking that, that they, they, they were kind of, um, they go hand in hand, but they are really different parts of the statute um, where um, eligibility is um, 6313 and where um, the funding formula is, is this a different section of, of the statute. Um, they're really, um, I mean, we could decouple it um, and, 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 and change one, but not change the other. So, so that's kind of the analysis that we're running through. We, we really want to take a deep dive and make sure um, that if we were going to uh, support a pursuit of a, a statutory change that we've considered how um, the impact of it. And, and, and to go to what Erica was saying, um, specifically around how the, the funding landscape is going to change in California, because as you know, um, the IOFA statute was promulgated in the early 80s, and we're the largest funder of legal services in California. Um, so any change to the IOFA formula is going to change um, how funding is distributed throughout the state, and that's going to have a real impact. So we want, it, we want it to be a really thoughtful process, and we want to engage the community, and we also um, want to talk to the community um, so that they understand what what the impact um, as a whole is, as well as for, the, for their program. And so that's that, what that survey is meant to, uh, to achieve um, so that they know kind of what the options and what the impact is. But we're, we're doing the analysis so that we can package it and present it to them. So that, that's the next couple of weeks um, work in our office. We're hoping to send out that survey early December um, then we have an ad hoc um, commission meeting December 15, um, and we're hoping um, between now and then um, to work with Amin and the Rules Committee um, to see um, what type of decision making um, the commission needs to make um, in terms of um, delegating authority. Um, the other option is if the commission decides not to, to kind of delegate authority um, to, you know, a, a sub entity or the Rules Committee um, to make a final recommendation to the Board of Trustees, um, we will need to call kind of an ad hoc um, a commission meeting um, before um, the Board of Trustees meeting in, 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 um, in January. Um, so that's what we're kind of working backwards towards is that we'd love to bring a recommendation to the Board of Trustees in January. Um, uh, uh, the Board of Trustees has to approve um, kind of their um, legislative um, advocacy work. And so we would like to present it to them in January. So just kind of working backwards, um, there's a little bit of a compressed timeline. We, you know, because they're all the stakeholders are kind of in alignment, we really don't want to miss this opportunity. So we're really trying as best we can to gather the inf information and do the analysis. But I think that would probably lean on the commission um, delegating that, that, that the authority to somebody um, to finalize a recommendation. Uh, but we'll, we'll put together a proposal uh, along with a mean um, that we'll present to you at the December 15th commission meeting. Um, then assuming we, we have the data and everything runs smoothly, um, we would be um, presenting that, that recommendation to the Board of Trustees in January. Um, and then after that, we'll be providing kind of our, our analysis um, to LAC and working with them in partnership. Um, and LAC would probably be the one um, that we're making that, that, that ask to the legislature and we'll be providing the support and, and the additional analysis. Go on. Corey Freeman had a question in the chat. Of course. And let me stop sharing. Um, let me see. Any recent indication from the Board of Trustees on the issue of an IOLTA bill or the timing or politics? Corey, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not quite understanding your, your question. What do you? Um, just if we, um, if the, this idea of, of um, the, the the changes has been discussed. I mean, it, it. your presentation kind of answered my question, which is that they're gonna hear about it possibly in, in January, but I don't know if there's been communication previously to get some kind of invitation, in, indication of what, 
what the board thought of it. You know, I, I don't think there has, but you know, we're, we're lucky to have a new access liaison who's here with us today, Christine Gonan. And Andrea is going to be providing some introductions to Christine, um, you know, in the next agenda item. Um, but but we're hoping, um, you know, and working closely in collaboration as we always have with the Board of Trustees. Um, we had a really great relationship with um, Debbie and Chris before um, that, that the, there will be an understanding of, of you know, um, before it even gets before the Board of Trustees, um, kind of the impetus and the reasoning for doing this. So Duan and Erica, are you complete with your presentation? Don't yes, and we, we'd, to... love any, we'd love any feedback, any preliminary um, thoughts. Um, like, like we said, Jim has been working really closely with us on the data piece, and we will um, share with you more data as we have it. And perhaps in, in, in December, we, we might be in a position to, to sh uh, um, do a deeper kind of discussion on this. But we wanted to give you a preliminary that this has been happening, and, um, and it's been a, a very involved process. So, um, and Jim has just been pivotal to that. Well, I want to I want to just um, acknowledge I mean for his uh, leadership in in the rules committee. I mean this is not an easy task, um, and the entire committee that's uh, rolled up their sleeves to take this on. I mean there's a, there's a lot, and um, much of it can be uh, hovering on con confident. Con well, I'll leave that word out. Um, I won't go there. But thank you. Thank you, guys. And then really, uh, Duan and team, um, for everything that you guys are doing to steward this process. Um, and I think we need to also make sure that we're um, we're keeping the, 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 the communication with LAC. Um, and so I know that Selena's there at the table every time you guys are meeting. So, so thank you. Um, Jim, your... Um, your expertise is is essential um, on this timely conversation. Um, I think it's uh, it's due time. So thank you so much for everything that you're bringing to it. And I think you had something that you wanted to just share. Oh, well, the, one of the issues that was raised during the committee was when you're using national levels to distribute resources like the federal poverty income, which is what we have been doing, that leads to one set of resource distributions, but if you use something that's based on the relative population size, which those formulas that are based on median income are based on relative population size of counties, the concern was if you shift to such a definition would that radically draw resources away from the rural areas. So one of the things that we're doing is we're using the, um, the, um, the definition that was developed by the uh, California Access to Justice Commission in their California Rural Housing Crisis Report, uh, their Appendix A, where counties in California are divided up by rural, rural urban mixed and uh, urban rural mix and then pure urban. And using that classification, the counties were actually gonna run uh, test numbers to see if we use the uh, median income, does that shift resources away from the rural areas, because that's one of the concerns of the, rural com of, the, of the committee that we don't want to do that. So we'll have actual empirical numbers so that agencies can see if we, which rule we adopt, what, sec what impact will that do to the resource allocations. Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, in queue currently we have Rich and then Catherine in that order, please. Hi, I, I just wanted to, to point out uh, to Jeff and Catherine, uh, who haven't been with us for a while, and it's good to see um, that what the Rules Committee doing is doing is writing regs to the enabling legislation. Uh, you know, we have a broad brush, uh, statutory brush that needs refinement, and that's what our Rules Committee is doing. Thank you for that context. Catherine? Mine was a question that might have partially been answered by Jim Meeker, but at, um, among the data points that seem important is to understand the increased number of people that are potentially eligible under a revision to the formula, um, particularly during a period of decreasing resources. So it, it's always good to be able to, it's good to be able to serve more people, but if the amount of money available is less, but the number of people eligible is more, I think that creates different pressures on programs. And so I just would be interested in understanding that as part of the discussion um, when we meet next. 
Uh, and that's that's a really good point, um, Catherine. And that that's a number that we could um, pull pretty easily. Um, there there was one thing about the data that Jim did mention to us um, because right now we run the IOLTA funding formula based on the five year ACS uh, survey. Um, but now that we're we're in a pandemic and there's more kind of um, migration across California, and and we don't know this is a theory, but um, there may be more migration towards rural. Um, areas um, that ACA, ACS data is, is going to be outdated, right? So it's already a five-year average. It's not the yearly one. Um, so so that's, that's something that we kind of need to think through because it's it's not going to really match the 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 true makeup of, of where people are now in California. Um, so I, I think we need to do a little bit of a deeper dive to see how we can um, tackle that issue. But we can get that information, Catherine, for by the next meeting. Thanks so much. Great. Anyone else have a comment or a question for this team? Just wanted to add that this looks like a great step because this is a critical component, having seen it personally. So thank you. Yeah, great work, um, you guys. This is this is a uh, much needed. All right, um, shall we move on to the other agenda item that we're taking out of turn? Uh, and this is for Chris Schreiber who needs to jump off as well. Uh, the homelessness uh, prevention grants. Duan and Chris, would you guys like to lead? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Bonashe. And hopefully I'll be back. Um, so only off for a little while when it happens, but um, Duan, do you want me to go or do you wanna? Um, maybe I can give the backdrop of the homelessness and then you can talk about um, sure. your update. Um, so I think as you all recall, um, earlier this year, um, the, legis the legislature passed um, AB um, 83, uh, which allocated $31 million through the National Foreclosure Settlement um, to the state bar um, to fund homelessness prevention work. So the legislation is, is almost identical to the $20 million that we received um, last year uh, with exception without, they took out the prohibition on spend down. Um, so we don't have that prohibition anymore. So it, it, it's slightly more um, generous. Um, so uh, we, um, as you all know, um, the, the commission um, approved an RFP that was released um, uh, a few months ago. We have received um, kind of the RFP um, applications. Um, they were due on Friday, October 9th, and we received um, 39 applications, um, totaling $39 million of requests. And, you know, of the $31 million, only a quarter of that is going to RFP. So we have about $7.4 million to distribute through RFP, and we received nearly $40 million. So we have a large task in front of us, the HP committee, in terms of sifting through and really, really closely um, the RFP applications. I'm really pleased to report that um, there are many, many excellent, excellent proposals out there and programs really kind of geared up um, in a very short time frame um, to submit um, a, a project proposals. And, and they have really been engaging with um, commissioners, staff um, within um, the community um, to, to put together project proposals, um, to try to collaborate, to try to really um, think outside the, of, of the box. Um, so with that, I'll hand it over um, to, to Chris. Yeah, thanks, Juan. Um, so uh, just to give background and just to remind folks what happened, as Duan said, there's this 31 million, it's divided into two, two pots of um, formula funding and an RP that went out. Um, we, during past commission meetings, we've sort of discussed the idea that our hope was that the RFP portion of the, of the distribution would be directed toward um, services that you know had, aren't typically provided or can't be provided because of the very emergent issues that most programs are facing in this regard. So we, in order to facilitate that, we held a convening uh, on September 16th. Uh, that was in partnership with Judicial Council, and um, it, it, I guess I, I would say it was very well attended. I can't remember the the number of attendees, but it was dozens and dozens. Uh, over 140 people attended. It was very well attended. Yeah, which was really great. And, you know, our our hope in doing that was to sort of bring together people across the spectrum to talk about, you know, possibilities of how this money could be used in innovative ways. Our goal was to sort of, you know, I think, inspire people to think outside the box, to 
partner with organizations that maybe were non-traditional partners uh, to try to reach into new communities and across the state into new areas. Um, the, what I'd say, you know, just to echo a little bit of what Juan said, is that the timeline on this is extremely tight. And this money is going to be going out the door in January. Mm -hmm. um, so programs were acting very quickly to put together proposals. And the committee has been broken down into subgroups to review programs. My particular group with Jim Meeker and Dan uh, has been very robust. We've had a lot of discussions and the rubric that has been ironed out, I think has really been honed actually to, uh, to address you know, a variety of different considerations. So the goal here, and I'm just gonna read um, or mention a couple other points about the convening, which is uh, Senator Scott Weiner was there. He's the chair of the Senate um, Housing Committee and he addressed the group and discussed sort of various efforts underway in Sacramento uh, to address homelessness. Um, the general counsel of the California Housing Finance Agency, Clara Terranian, and I don't think I'm pronouncing that correctly, but um, um, my, apology, my apologies for that. Uh, she talked about Cal HFA's preliminary distribution plans for $300 million from the National Mortgage Settlement. So there was sort of a, a variety of different discussions that took place. We had panel discussions as well during the convening. And I think ultimately the proof is in the pudding. I think the program's response to the, to the grant process has been um, good and innovative in important ways. Uh, Juan, you have sort of a, and I think staff has a sense of the, the broad range I'm still sort of in one of the silos with Dan and Jim. So I haven't seen all of the uh, program applications yet, but certainly uh, it's encouraging. And I think, you know, in terms of bringing it as a model in other funding, I do think there are some things that we can take away from it and maybe apply in the future. So. Anyway, very positive. There'll be more to report out, I think, at the next meeting. And we are moving quite quickly to review and assess all these applications. Great. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Dawn. Uh, really, I'm in one of those silos, too. And uh, the discussions have been quite robust where we are. Um, Herman is actually the quiet one in the group. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there's there's. A lot of takeaways, Chris, and then we're, we're actually um, sharing out with Elizabeth our thinking. So uh, hopefully we receive more funds next year and we could incorporate the learning from this year and the previous year uh, going forward. But the need is, is, um, is high. And uh, that's, that's uh, definitely a, a big takeaway in terms of um, potentially if we were to receive more funds next year, yeah. uh, asking for more. You know, one, I think one other thing I, I wanted to mention, sorry, Monashe, um, sure. was just, was that, you know, just one last sort of by way of background comment, which is many of the programs have been doing UD work for years and that, that has been a feature of a lot of their work. And so, I think we had really encouraged them to think beyond intervening in the process at such a late stage. And so I do think the programs took that to heart. We, we did see sort of an expansion of existing services, certainly in some of the program applications. And I don't wanna you know, diminish uh, the importance or value of the work that A is being done and that B doing more of it would bring, but I think we were sort of hopeful that the RFP process would, would allow them to do new things. And so we've certainly seen evidence of that in the proposals. And just, we, this is a three-year grant process. So people are asking for a lot of money. 
Um, and I would say that there's been a lot of ambition shown in the grant. <laughs> people are, they're, they're going for it. So I, I respect that. Um, you know, our job is to steward the money as wisely as we can, but damn, I mean, this is going to be a lot of money getting out the door very quickly in very short uh, time frame. Um, and obviously it's a crisis, so that's a good thing. And, and Chris so, gave some really passionate remarks at the convening and um, literally the next day there are programs that called and were qu quoting Chris and um, they really, really um, took what this commission has had to say and, and pushed themselves and challenged themselves to think outside the box. So um, yeah, thank you, Chris, for your leadership on this committee. I echo that. Um, any questions or comments uh, from the commission on this presentation? I had some questions on the um, this. I think you were mostly talking about the discretionary funds, the RFPs. Um, can we get a little bit of an update on the other, the uh, formula allocation funds? Sure, sure. Um, so we um, we released the the formula application a couple weeks before we released the RFP, and we received back um, the formula um, applications. Um, staff did an initial review um, to see if there are any, um, you know, with the formula application, um, it's it's an easier requirement because it's not competitive grant. They just have to certify that they're engaging in, you know, ev eviction defense, homelessness prevention work. So staff reviewed that to make sure it was qualifying activities um, to resolve um, issues at the staff level. Um, and then there were two programs that were a little bit more questionable, which we elevated to um, the committee for review. At the end of the day, the committee ended up approving all of that, that slate of um, applications. Um, we then, re it's kind of like IOLTA and EF in that it's a two prop process. Um, once we know how many programs are eligible, we then run um, the formula. It's a modified IOLTA formula is what the statute uh, prescribes how the formula allocation goes out for HP um, with a $50,000 minimum. So once we have the total amount of um, programs are eligible, we ran the formula for them. We gave them the, the, their award amount and um, they, um, they submitted budgets. We're in the process now of reviewing those budgets and we will elevate to the committee any outstanding issues issues. Um, if there are no outstanding issues, it will go before the larger commission on December 15th um, to approve both our formula grants and the RFP grants. And um, behind the scenes, um, Brady and I are working on the grant agreement so that as soon as you um, approve the grants, um, we release grant agreements um, with the distribution of January. So it's, 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 it's very, very fast. And a lot of the processes are, have to be layered for us to get the money out the door in January. And that money that's going out, that's going to be uh, dispersed over three years. Is that it's, my it's understanding? A, it's a three-year grant, um, and they get um, the funding um, every year. So they'll get three checks, year one, year two, year three. Oh, at the beginning of each year. OK. Yeah. And was there then, a particular? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Will. Was there a particular reason that uh, it was decided to divide it up into three years instead of giving them the full lump sum now? Um, the progress reports, we typically don't, we, we have provided multi-year grants, but we've never provided um, the lump sum in a three-year grant or, or, or multi-year grant. It's generally, you know, per year. And we feel like that's being good stewards of the funding. Um, if, if there's an issue, the month, not the complete, all the money's out the door. Um, and it seems reasonable um, and programs are used to it. So I, I, that felt like it was not that controversial to decide to release the funding um, one year at a time. And so I for think some that of makes our sense. other grants, I, it's quarterly, actually. I, I guess I'm I'm wondering how we got to the place where it was decided to get, use a three-year period instead of uh, just distributing it all this year. I think the last year's disbursement was all contained within a single year. Last year's disbursement was um, over an 18-month period, and that's why we went to do the formula distribution um, I think a month or two right after we received the funding, um, but there in the legislation was built in a spend down requirement, uh, was I was referring to was the difference between this legislation and last legislation, um, where it, the, the previous legislation required the funding to be spent um, by June 2021. This legislation does not require that. So the committee, um, you know, thought really um, long and hard about what the distribution period was and landed on a three year would be appropriate in consultation also with LAC and, and feedback from the community. And that seemed to be everybody was in support of that generally. Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's unanimous across the board, but there is general support. Okay. I, th I think I have some concerns that if there is a need, especially uh, right now during the crisis, the public health emergency, 
that it's all going to be hitting in the next few months as the pandemic uh, would tend to surge as the housing protections are going to taper off. And if organizations can use that money right now, I would rather give them the bigger hose than the garden hose and spread yeah. it out over the three years. Yeah, absolutely. And that, that was something I think the rules committee and I can let um, Chris kind of elaborate, um, but because there's funding right now and programs are actually, um, having challenges spending down because of court closure. And as you know, there are moratoriums um, across California and nationally, the CDC moratorium, that the wave of evictions actually hasn't hit yet. Everybody's anticipating for it to hit um, early next year once once it's lifted, but, but programs are actually not having that surge of need yet. We do anticipate. And so there will be, there's an overlap of, of six months um, in terms of the last um, uh, uh, funding and then the, the current funding. Uh -huh. so, so we do think that, you know, it's, it's appropriate use. We don't know, it, it, uh, there's gonna be a reassessment probably next year once we see kind of um, what, what that eviction wave is gonna look like. But, but um, it, it wasn't a decision that was made lightly. Again, it was in consultation with LAC and in hearing um, from our programs that it felt like that was appropriate. Um, of amount of time. And I can let Chris kind of elaborate. Yeah, Chris, if you want to uh, say anything right. more about that, and then uh, I think Kim also has a comment to this. Yeah, I, I guess I'd just say I felt like we led from behind in that respect. Uh, we, we did listen. Selena can probably comment on this, but you know, one of the big challenges just in general, and I think this was evident with the first $20 million that the legislature granted is just that capacity building actually takes time. And, and so the, the fire hose um, is needed to put out the crisis, but, it, but drinking from the fire hose is, is, is its own challenge. And so for the organizations, like what we had heard, and I think what we had seen is that the best, their best laid plans in terms of trying to hire staff and build capacity were challenged by, in this instance, also by COVID. So, you know, just getting technology and everything in place, the three years actually, I guess my takeaway and my ultimate conclusion was that it was appreciated that they had the time to build the capacity and then use that to spend down the money to trying to you know, rush it out the door in a way that maybe they weren't able to, maybe maybe not even able to do that. So, yeah, as Duan said, I, I think that was a listening to the community on that one. Yeah, um, we'll go to Kim, and then Selena also has a comment on this. Uh, but just from the the applications that. I was able to read. Uh, there's exactly what Chris and Dewan are speaking to. You know, that first year they're looking to find the people that they want to hire. You know, be thoughtful in rolling this out. So I think um, having that time uh, makes a lot of sense based on just what they've put in their timeline for their applications and their submission. Um, so Kim and Selena, please. So my comment is um, similar to what's been said, but from a different, a little bit different perspective, and that is of the um, substantive work. Um, we have been encouraging the use of these funds for more than just UD defense. Um, and the importance of that is recognized by everybody, but trying to, build some other frameworks for preserving and also developing more housing opportunities for low-income individuals and families. And so a three-year span allows for more long-term development of sustainable projects. And I'm all about sustainability in these projects, which also includes connecting with community organizations that will live on uh, in their work after the grant. So I think for substantive reasons, in addition to just um, uh, Chris's uh, fi fire hose imagery, um, you know, there's really good reasons to ha to to have a, a lengthy a, a lengthy project, and with the hope that more 
that more money will come through, come through. But I mean, we, I think we all recognize William, like you, that, you know, this, this wave of evictions has started and will continue on. We're hoping that the work with this money will do more than defense work. Thank you, Kim. Selena, please. And then uh, Will has uh, a follow-up. Selena was just doing a, a quick sort of um, readjustment. So um, I'm not sure she's... Oh. Are you with us, Selena? Yes, sorry, my doorbell rang. Um, <laughs> but I answer it with a mask. Um, no one else is at my house. Um, yeah, my only comment is just to kind of answer the question about timeline of, of releasing is in, in complete agreement with what Chris and others have said. I don't think that there's a perfect fit for every single program, but I thought it was very prudent of the committee to select three years. Because what I've heard consistently from programs is that it's been hard to hire, um, both before the pandemic because of our recruitment challenges, because of our low wages, but also during the pandemic, it's been a little bit harder to figure out um, onboarding and also hiring and, and whether or not people need to move and some people are moving out of state now. So there's a lot of wrinkles to that. So having a little bit of flexibility to spend the money over time will actually help with recruitment because at least from what I've heard um, and in my own experience, if you tell someone you're hiring them for a position and the grant funding is only for a year, um, you're not likely to get a lot of really great candidates. But if you say that the grant funding is secured for three years and that you'll work to make it ongoing or that you can look for other funding, it actually helps with the recruitment. So I think three years is prudent. I think some programs may say they'd rather have it at two, but um, between one year and three years, I think three years is a much better option. Oh, and I'm sorry, one final point is that um, you know, we've done a lot of disaster work, not in the relation to the pandemic, but other disaster related work. And although there may be kind of um, acute legal issues at the beginning of a disaster or pandemic, there will be long lasting legal problems that will last for several years, um, especially consumer debt issues, um, other issues related to employment, um, you know, all sorts of issues, though, there'll be a long tail of, of legal issues. And so having three years of funding will let those programs really identify what are the ripple effects of people who may not be evicted now, but maybe they've um, exhausted all of their family resources and a year from now they're really facing eviction, they may need help then. Thank you, Selena. Uh, Will, you had said you'd like to follow up um, after giving everyone else a chance. Bonnie just uh, uh, came in. Would you like to wait until after Bonnie's comment or would you please, like to go now? Please, yeah, go ahead. Bonnie. Okay, go ahead, Bonnie. Sorry, I, I think the other reality is that we, this came from a very specific funding source, um, which was the settlement on the housing foreclosure. And I think we all know that state and federal budgets are gonna be incredibly impacted. And as a former legal services program manager, as you know, there's nothing worse than hiring people and then having to lay them off and nothing worse than for the community to um, have a great program that then you can't support. So um, I think that's the other, you know, kind of concern I, I suspect for some of the programs in terms of thinking about how they can provide the best possible services for the community. Obviously we all want more money, but it's, it's, um, it's a difficult time. Thank you, Bonnie. Uh, Will? Thank you. I, uh, I really appreciate that feedback. I think it's very helpful and uh, uh, reassuring. I think uh, I need to explain just a little bit more uh, my understanding and thinking here because I think the context is important. Um, I would not propose uh, uh, requiring a spin down immediately. I was thinking more along the lines of giving them the money and then requiring a spin down within a three year period so that they have the flexibility and ability to adjust based on their local circumstances and the reality on the ground for them. I think that's the maximum uh, sort of flexibility that could be granted with this funding. And I guess I, I would go on to say that, for example, what at the convening uh, meeting, which was excellent. I hope everyone got to see or attend or watch a recording. Uh, one of the organizations that presented 
actually found that one of the best tools they had was settlements with landlords. I don't know if this money could be used for that, but I didn't see a restriction because it's, it's pretty broad in housing. And so having uh, the ability, if their programs could support that, to take that money and do settlements when they feel appropriate would give them the discretion. I think that could be really helpful in maximizing the response while totally understanding uh, Selena's point that it is going to be ongoing. There are going to be a lot of long tail issues. But at the, I guess, when it's down to give us money or get out, uh, that's an immediate area where um, that funding could be useful. And so I, I wouldn't want to like uh, require a, a quicker spin down. I understand the complexities of that. And I would just, I would add two other real quick points to that. Um, one is a question, which is, can we make an adjustment to that um, spending level or ask the Board of Trustees to make an adjustment if we do see that there is a need that develops over the next quarter or two quarters? And then second, I guess um, when looking at the statute, I think the construction of it makes me believe that they really wanted us to get the money out with the least restrictions uh, possible as, as quickly as practicable practicable was their wording. And I, I, I worry that withholding in this way uh, creates more problems and doesn't grant the sort of um, improvement in oversight since all of these people are already IOLT, IOLTA um, programs. They are already gonna be part of the oversight um, process that I think would be necessary if we were giving to untested programs or untested agencies. You really would want to kind of hold back. Those are my my thoughts, and, and I'm hoping that I can get some some further feedback on them. Thank you. Sure, I, I can try to answer um, one and one and three. Um, so the, 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 your your point about. Um, giving programs flexibility. We actually did have a program that um, is receiving a small formula a, a grant and asked um, us, um, it can, can they, it's not, um, they have the cash to, to kind of pay up through the years, but they wanted to be able to um, provide the services, like you said, um, up front in one year rather than two years. And, you know, staff, um, we were, were looking into it to see um, whether it's practically possible in terms of how our grant funding is, is set up and our, our grant payment. And we think it is. And if it is, then our, our recommendation that will go to the committee is to give that flexibility so that that I hope that addresses your but we, we are very responsive to programs. So if we hear kind of requests like that, um, we always uh, work with programs to see if we can accommodate that and then elevate it to the commission to see um, um, whether there's approval. Um, and then in response to your, your third question, um, we have uh, been in regular communication with the legislature. They know about our funding um, plans and our distribution. Um, and so it does seem like everybody's um, comfortable with that. Um, we are, um, anytime we go to do a distribution, um, we have OGC um, in consultation to make sure that um, we're in compliance with the statute. Um, so we're covered there as well. Um, and then I, I wasn't quite uh, understanding your second question, Will, about the Board of Trustees, because the Board of Trustees is, um, is not who's providing the funding. It's, it's coming through the National Mortgage Settlement. It's a contract that we have with the Judicial Council. Um, uh, the, the Judicial Council receives the funding, and then we have a contract with them to distribute the funding. So Body and I are actually working right now um, as we speak to finalize the contract. So just so, just so you know, um, administratively, we do all this work, and and the funds actually have not literally um, hit the state bar um, account yet. So this is all kind of, it, it's just like I said, a lot of staggered pieces um, that we try to get out the door. And it's, 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 it's really very, very fast in our office. And the commission has, this committee in particular, has been working really hard to get the funding out as, as soon as possible. So from my perspective, it is as soon as practically possible. But well, that's well, that's good. Good. <laughs> The one other point, though, don't, I wasn't sure, Will, the, the RFP portion of the money doesn't necessarily go to IOLTA funded organizations. They, they can receive funding um, as sub-grantees. So the lead organization yeah. oh, yeah, yeah. IOLTA, but um, so there are going to be a number of sub-grants that will be to non-IOLTA funded organizations. Thank you, Duan, for that clarification. I, I, I only meant the Board of Trustees in the, in the terms of we could not adjust the funding, I, or at least my understanding of our process is we don't adjust, make adjustments, we request that the Board of Trustees make the or approve our changes. That's all. 
Well, the Board of Trustees, I guess just to clarify, uh, the Board of Trustees doesn't approve our grant awards. They approve our IOLTA distribution and they approve, um, and they approve um, distribution plans. But because um, there's a very clear statute and the requirements for this, we were not required to bring it to the Board of Trustees. But um, in, in, in contrast, the bank grant money, um, the distribution plan that's designed from the, from, from the commission will get elevated to the Board of Trustees. Okay, friends, this is a uh, obviously a, an important conversation. I don't want to cut us off too early, um, but we do have a large uh, agenda ahead of us, um, and we're already at 1.30. So if there's um, any other comments or questions that you guys might have, you may want to reach out. Well, Chris, I'm about to say this, to Chris and Dawn <laughs> directly uh, for any further comments or questions on the issue. But thank you guys so much for all the work that you're doing on this. This is no easy task um, ahead of us. And thank you, Will, for all of those uh, important questions that you were asking. Okay, so um, it's 1.30. Dwan wanted me to give everybody a break at this point. Um, if you guys would like to do that, we can do that. Otherwise, we can move back into the, um, the, the, the rest of the agenda and start with the state bar reports. Anyone want to take a break? Should we go on? Okay, go on. All right. So, Andrea, please take it away with the uh, with your report. Uh, and thanks so much for the very kind introduction and welcome earlier. Um, I'm very excited to be in this role and to be working with all of you. Um, I care deeply about access to justice issues and I've had the chance to work on them as a legal aid attorney, as a pro bono counsel, but I'm very excited to, um, to get to work with this office and with the commission. Um, I just have a couple quick updates. The first is a, a staffing update. Um, for those of you who don't know yet, uh, two employees who I know many of you have worked with before, uh, Greg Shin and Frank Bittner, departed shortly before I stepped into this role. Um, while transitions always present challenges, we're very excited to have two new senior program analysts joining us um, beginning at the end of this month. Um, so the two new people will be welcoming. Uh, Judy McMahon McManigal um, is an immigration attorney by training, but spent much of her career in operations and administration. She's also on the board of directors of One Justice and has um, in that capacity worked on statewide access to justice issues. Um, the second new employee we'll be welcoming is Chris McConaughey, who's coming to us from One Justice, where he served as the director of finance, um, pardon the background noise. Um, and prior to that, he was a legal aid attorney. Um, we're excited to welcome them both on board and we think their skill sets will really complement um, the work of this office and of the commission. Um, I also just wanted to note that we will be hiring, uh, we're beginning the process of hiring two new senior financial analysts, also filling vacant positions. Um, we are focusing more on finance. Okay, sorry. Um, so- Jane, uh, can I ask you to move a little closer to the microphone or oh, to yes. speak it uh, okay. a little louder? Can you hear Thank me? You. Okay, okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, we're hiring two new financial analysts and that greater emphasis on finance, we think will really complement our IOLTA and bank compliance work and will also allow us to rely less than we have in the past several years on some outside contractors and other professional services. So we are very much in the process of working on fully staffing up the office, which, um, which is exciting and um, you know, as you know, we have very, very hardworking staff in this office and, you know, remain committed to uh, reaching all the deadlines and moving forward important work, especially time sensitive work, like the HP grants we were just talking about. Um, but I would also just make the note that because of the transitions and some understaffing in the near term, um, we do always have to look at what is more and less time sensitive when we prioritize what we're going to focus on. And so that's always a consideration um, that we just ask you to keep to keep in mind, but very excited to hopefully be um, fully staffed up um, and moving forward um, shortly. Um, a quick update on the paraprofessional working group. I just wanted to share that we're presenting an agenda item for the board next week to appoint a new chair to that working group. And we think that that new chair is going to be well positioned to move the group's work forward. 
Um, finally, uh, we usually include information on the diversity of this commission of the Legal Services Trust Fund in the roster. Um, and while participation is voluntary, we will be sending out a survey soon, um, and we hope that you'll complete that and we'll uh, share that information, that updated roster, um, as soon as we have it. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone again for the warm welcome and to really encourage you, you know, please reach out to me directly um, at any time or just to say hi, um, you know, really look forward to, um, to getting to work with all of you and my door or I guess my Zoom is open um, uh, to touch base on any of these topics. Um, but moving right along, I actually think the next agenda item is mine as well. Great. So. Um, as I was so warmly welcomed, I wanted to extend a warm welcome to our new liaison from the board, Christine Ganong, who's our new access liaison. Um, obviously, this is there's a lot going on in access, so I understand that there will be a second liaison appointed, appointed soon, um, but wanted to take the chance to welcome Christine. So Christine practices complex, complex litigation focusing on catastrophic injury. She's clerked for several judges, including Justice Mario Ramil of the Hawaii Supreme Court and Justice uh, and Circuit Judge Jacqueline Nguyen of the US Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. She's also served as a litigation associate at Jones Day. Christine's committed to public service and is a prominent member of the Filipino American legal community. And she participates in various events throughout the nation, empowering Asian American women in the law and she also serves as adjunct faculty at the US, USC School of Law. Um, I've had the chance to connect with Christine and I know that she also cares deeply about this work um, and we're so glad she's serving in the liaison role. Um, Christine, would you like to, to say any, to make any remarks? I'll be very brief, but um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much for the warm welcome. Andrea, and I look forward to working with um, everyone here in the commission and with the Office of Access and um, Inclusion. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so those were my updates. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, on behalf of the commission, Christine, thank you for joining. We look forward to having you. Of course, we're going to miss Chris and Debbie, um, but we know that uh, you're going to be serving us uh, well, so thank you for being here. Uh, I think Zahira, you have a quick comment that you'd like to make, and then we could go on with the rest of the staff bar reports um, with Carolina. Please go ahead, sure. Zahira. And maybe if you could just, in terms of where we are um, on the agenda, I'm also happy to kind of, um, you know, put it in at another point. Um, but welcome, Andrea. I, I just. Um, there was a piece that was talked about in terms of like the work of the team moving forward. And I know later in the agenda, there's a work plan discussion. Um, and I was curious in terms of the justice gap work, which is, um, uh, looks like it's, it's not, not on the agenda. I don't know if it's because it's all been completed. And then I'm also just curious, um, there was also a mention about the diversity of the commission. I wonder if the commission also gets feedback on the diversity of the staff. Um, so I was just, in terms of just some of the pieces that were brought up, was curious about kind of like the conversation and the back and forth uh, about that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's a really good question. To my knowledge, and it's three weeks of knowledge, um, I don't <laughs> believe we have reported on the diversity of the staff of this office in particular. Um, one conversation I will say we're having on the diversity and inclusion side is, um, of course, we want to be modeling best practices um, within the bar and within the office. And so are, are looking at within this office in particular and the bar as a whole, um, how we can uh, best move forward in a way that is supportive of diversity and inclusion in our own internal policies. And so um, that's a really, a, a really good and valid question. And I think it's something we should definitely consider uh, reporting on um, as well as um, getting that information from the state bar. Um, I do think Andrew, the state can I add bar can I as a whole, sorry, sure. does have demographic information on the staff. I don't know if that's office specific, um, but happy to to look into that. Um, Dawn, is that accurate? Yeah, we have it as, as the that. bar, but perhaps not. So I was gonna add that the state bar um, is planning on um, 
a, a, a releasing a survey to all staff. Um, and once they do, and hopefully we can disaggregate that information and and, and share with you what the makeup of our our own offices. But that hasn't happened. Andrea is correct. We don't have that information right now. It does not exist. Yeah, but it's and a good I, question. And I, I just point out to everybody as they think about um, um, this area to to bear in mind that. Um, uh, Proposition 16 did not pass, um, so we, we still operate under the uh, restrictions of Proposition 209 in terms of bar hiring. So our uh, there are things that we can do in our recruiting to um, try and uh, try and increase the diversity of our um, our hiring pool, but um, we're we're somewhat limited in the um, in the steps we can take um, to uh, promote diversity in hiring. Thank you, Brady. And you also mentioned the justice gap. Um, so for the justice gap to the next iteration of that report, um, it is not that that is a back burner issue at all. Um, the, the reason we left it crossed out is because we, we, we weren't trying to uh, just take it off the agenda. We wanted to note that um, we don't yet know what the next version of the report will look like. And I want to do some strategic thinking um, and very much welcome feedback about how a second report can be most useful. What additional information can we add? Um, what, what, other, what other data points? What other kinds of um, information would be most helpful in moving the access to justice mission forward, um, as well as how can we best publicize any additional reports that we do publish? Um, so we're already having internal strategic discussions about that and hope to be able to share soon and, and probably get more, have a, a more formal process to get feedback from this commission about um, how we can best use that. So we don't wanna just churn out another report um, before thinking a little bit strategically about how we can really add um, to the great work that was already done um, and add information that's of value and think about what other things we could look at that maybe we didn't examine would be um, helpful uh, in this mission and for the community. So again, since we're in the brainstorming process internally, I very much welcome any thoughts about what we might want to consider um, when, we look, when we look towards um, what Justice Gap 2 will, will involve. And if I could just jump in uh, just a little bit more, Zahira, on the justice gap. My understanding is, um, as Andrea has, has, has mentioned, but uh, a little bit more, is that this next year, because of COVID and because of all that's before us, um, and hopefully with uh, Jeff Ball being here and supporting, as we're still, you know, the the federates are still hovering around zero, so that there's there's so much uh, before us in that in those regards that um, justice gap uh, study was kind of put on hold, um, so that there could be uh, more focus on the items that are in front of us, um, while the staff is going in and doing a deep dive to um, strategize next steps. Yeah, and as I said, uh, the hope and I think my expectation is that soon we will be more fully staffed um, after several different internal transitions. And so I think that will also allow us to, you know, have have the resources to make for we're moving all of these things forward and being thoughtful and strategic about them. Great. Um, any other comments or questions on up to this point before we turn to Carolina? Okay, hearing none. Uh, Carolina, please. Hey, great. I'm Carolina Amaranti. I'm the program supervisor over the compliance team. Um, and much of, of my presentation is to talk through um, a little bit of high level of our IOLTA compliance work, um, providing a year to date update on where we are in terms of IOLTA revenue um, and put into perspective some of the projections that we made earlier on in the year. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. So again, um, I oversee the compliance team and that's two full-time program analysts and we monitor 173 IOLTA eligible financial institutions. So again, high level, what we mean in terms of our compliance work 
um, part of our, our state bar strategic goal is to support the increased funding and enhanced outcome measures for legal services. Um, in our current environment, um, that increased funding um, focus is, is crucial and really trying to maintain a steady flow of funding has been our priority. So our first component is that um, we ensure that any banks that wanna change their rates right now, that they do go through a full certification process. Um, our team reviews their internal um, rate products to ensure that we get the most competitive rate when they're choosing um, to not uh, go with a leadership bank um, option or a established compliance rate option where um, they're committing at a, a significantly higher rate uh, than what's being um, provided to the federal fund rate. Again, any um, IELTS eligible financial institution um, that, that wants to receive a client uh, trust funds accounts from our attorneys um, have to go through that recertification process. Um, again, you know, California licensed attorneys um, are required to put their funds with an IELTS eligible bank. Um, we have staff reviewing um, interest payments on a weekly basis. Um, that ensures that we are getting the deposits on a timely manner and that those rates are uh, the rates that they agreed upon um, during the recertification. Again, all of that ensures that we get our funding as expected on a monthly and quarterly and annual basis. Um, that can then be administered um, to the legal aid uh, organizations. In terms of where we are a year to date, um, it's been a bumpy year to say the least. Um, there's been a decrease in IOTA revenue, um, but not as uh, sharp as we initially um, planned, which is really good news given where the federal fund rate is right now. So um, many of you remember um, much of discussions that happened earlier this year, you know, where are we going to be at the end of the year and we're in, in, in a relatively good place. In March, we had a sharp decrease. Um, we were averaging about $3 million a month in January to March as part of our, our monthly revenue. Um, and then in April, we experienced that, that sharp decline to 1.9 million. Um, and we were going through um, some different scenarios and uh, our expectation that we would be um, decreasing, you know, relatively at 10% on a monthly basis. And, and, and that's, that hasn't been that experience. Again, prior to the decrease of the federal, uh, federal fund target rate, we were averaging 3 million. Now we average about 1.8 million. So we only experienced one sharp drop between March and April, but have been steady across all the months of April um, all the way to September. So again, experiencing only that one time sharp 40% decrease. Um, our top 10 banks, our top 10 revenue generating banks, they continue to provide 90% of our revenue. Um, our top three banks, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and Chase Bank, they committed to um, staying at the established compliance rate. And so when you recertify or when banks choose to, to certify as a IOTA eligible, institution, they can choose to um, be a leadership bank, which means they, they um, commit to providing a higher level rate above the established compliance rate, um, which is either the federal fund rate or 0.68 basis of the federal fund rate, um, which was the floor that was established by this commission um, in 2008. Um, so we have three banks, three of our largest generating uh, revenue generating banks that are committing to that established compliance rate, which has allowed us to maintain a steady flow of income um, for the last few months. On average, our top 10 rates are at 0.50 basis points, again, much higher than the 0.25 basis points, um, zero to 0.25 basis points that the federal fund target rate is at the moment. So, um, you know, April 2020, um, you know, was, was difficult. Um, but we've been able to maintain our uh, funds um, where that, to the extent that our decrease is, is relatively low on average 1% um, each month. Much of this work has been to the you know, hard work of the team. They have been reviewing emails, responding in a timely manner. And a lot too is dedicated to the automation of our work. We really prioritize automating much of our reconciliation, our reviews of um, deposit sheets so that we can spend more time developing stronger relationships with the banks, helping them understand um, what this process entails and really the value of participating in this program. So again, you know, we um, initially thought that um, 
funds would be, our, our revenue would be much lower. Um, again, earlier on the, on the year, we looked at three different scenarios. The more aggressive scenario was that there would be a sharp drop and that our rates would be on average 16 basis points, which is not what we're experiencing right now. Um, we felt that we would likely be in a moderate um, scenario where it'll be a slow gradual transition to a lower compliance rate. Um, we were assuming that banks that um, are that voluntarily committed to that established compliance rate, again, with that floor being 0.68 basis points, um, may choose to go for a more comparable rate, which is a lower rate, um, and that um, average compliance rate will drop um, by 68 basis points at the end of the year. And we're, we're not anywhere near that at the moment. Um, and we were assuming that there would be a relevancy around a 10% decrease in revenue in a month. Again, that's not where we are right now. And the more conservative one was uh, a scenario where it would be a moderate situation, but it would happen in June. So again, we are in a, in a, a good place. Um, we want to get back to that $3 million. Um, but again, you know, much of the work to the staff to maintaining those good relationships with the banks. Um, and we are evaluating where we can increase our revenue. So I'm excited for the new members on the commission that can help us with that process. If there's any questions, more than happy to answer. I had uh, one quick question. Um, Please, besides, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent news. Um, when the uh, economic uh, stimulus runs out, are we expecting a more severe drop? Or can we expect a more severe drop? Or is that too much of a prediction to ask for? It's, it's a strong prediction. I, I believe that, um, again, you know, all the IOTA programs are talking about this, this is a high priority. It's um, one of the key conversations on the national calls um, is that we're expecting the federal fund rate to continue to stay low. Um, and much of the work is about focusing on the relationship with the bank. So in the event that there is a, um, additional challenges in the economy, um, that they would not uh, turn to the IOTA program or IOTA accounts as opportunity for revenue um, because of the added value, especially in these um, you know, social and economic times, the value of having legal services and those banks showing that they're committed to that is a greater value to them. Any other uh, comments or questions? I have to go. Thank you to the staff for that. That's awesome news. Really appreciate it. Good luck on your hearing, Christian. Uh, any okay. others? I just wanted to um, commend staff and thank, thank them for keeping the rates where they are. That I, I, um, I think it's really impressive that you've maintained a relationship with the largest banks, especially such that they're still, um, they're still keeping those rates in this current environment. I, a lot of this happens backstage um, as far as the commission is concerned, but it's obviously incredibly important. And um, I, yeah, I think this is better news than anybody expected. And so thank you. Yeah, it's it's um, years in the uh, in the making. It's it shows the 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 history and the relationships. So great, great work, you guys. Really great work. Um, all right. So uh, shall we go on to Dwan and staff updates? Sure. I just have really quick, really quick update. So um, part of the linked agenda, um, there's a list of 2021 monitoring visits. So as you all know. Um, we go on monitoring visits to our programs every three years. So every year um, we do a third of all programs. So uh, next year we have about 34 programs that we're going on monitoring visits. Um, and because of um, COVID-19 and shelter in place orders, um, earlier this year we converted our in-person meetings to all remote, um, 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 remote uh, monitoring visits and it's, it's gone um, pretty exceptional. 
Um, it's, you know, as you know, being on Zoom the whole day is pretty tiring for both programs and staff, but otherwise um, it, it's, it's been excellent. I mean, we lose um, the ability to kind of walk around, um, grab lunch um, with the grantees, but, 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 but otherwise the information though um, ha has been um, a, a very close to being in person. Um, so I just want to report back that that's um, obviously um, a very good news that that's, that's been running smoothly. We will, we will plan to continue doing remote monitoring visits um, into uh, next year. Um, and and then reassess um, mid-cycle uh, and we'll work with Bonnie to, to see when would be appropriate to have in-person uh, monitoring business again. Um, I'd like to extend um, an invitation to commissioners to come along with us on monitoring visits. Now that there's not travel involved, you're welcome to come for the whole day, um, part of the day, um, whatever you like, we, we can be um, as accommodating um, as you need to be. So if you, there's a, a visit on that list um, that you are interested in attending, um, we can work around your schedule um, because we haven't scheduled any of them for 2021. Um, just um, shoot me an email and let me know. And then the other update, the last update for grant um, administration is that um, Brady and I have been working the last couple months on um, <clears throat> Um, streamlining our all of our grant agreements um, and adding some additional clauses. So all of our grant agreements um, will look and feel pretty much um, the same way unless there are additional restrictions to them. And we're adding in um, a few other clauses, um, re reporting requirements, compliance um, pieces, um, so that um, it would give the state bar and the commission authority um, if there was uh, a programs that are not in compliance. Uh, Brady, I don't know if you want to talk any more specifics about the grant agreement. Um, I mean, basically, the, the biggest changes are um, adding um, some explicit language about um, misrepresent making misrepresentations to the state bar and any reporting shall be a breach of the agreement um, that they need to report to us if they ever come under investigation by law enforcement or any of their other funding sources. Um, some of the issues that came up with the um, uh, with the, the compliance issue we had last year and um, with San Bernardino to um, avoid some of that and give us more tools uh, to address that. Um, but we've also been taking a look at um, responding to um, some um, minor concerns um, from the grantees about um, some standard contractual provisions that we had that um, weren't realistic or, or useful for them or for us. So for instance, um, we had some limitations on, um, you know, there was a, a requirement that was sort of honored in the breach uh, that, that, that grantees get pre-approval from us um, um, before, you know, uh, making um, certain public relations moves. And, and we don't want to enforce that. We don't want them to have to do that. So we, we basically just took a, lot, a look at all the requirements like that to make sure that they were working for both the grantees and for us. And that's the update. Bye. Great. Thank you. Thank you both. All right. Uh, let's move on to uh, IOLTA and Equal Access Fund. Uh, Erica and Eric, if you guys can lead the way. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Monashe. Eric, I don't see you on my set of pictures here, but I'm sure you're with us. Let me just say briefly, because I know we're we're getting late in the day here, that we have a couple of items of business to deal with today related to um, the Eligibility and Budget Review Committee, and they have to do with approving budgets for IOLTA grants and also approving requests to carry over budgets for 2021 grants and requests to carry over monies awarded in 2020. Just say by way of context, for those of you who don't know this, most of you probably do, so I won't go on at great length, that this, what we're doing today is really kind of the tail end of the, of the journey of the Eligibility and Budget Review Committee. Um, it starts with basically the process of looking at applications for IOLTA funding, um, which involves, of course, creating the application, having staff review whether the applicant has met the eligibility requirements, um, flagging issues for the committee, and then ultimately for the commission. And then once the grants are approved, we then get into the process of looking at budgets and request for carryovers. So that's, that's where we are at right now. I do wanna say that this year, because of the pandemic, uh, the commission uh, agreed to show grantees flexibility and particularly to allow them an extension of time to submit their, their applications. Usually they're submitted in May, I believe, and this year we gave the projects until June, but the committee and the commission did not extend the back end, which had the effect of compressing the work that was required to go through the grants and assess eligibility and things of that nature. 
which put a really significant burden on staff and also commissioners, but mostly staff. And so I do wanna say that and call out particularly the work of the staff this year. They did a, a remarkable job going through the applications and flagging the issues and efficiently um, running through the process. And particularly I would call out uh, Erica, who has been the staff uh, person coordinating the committee's work. Duan, of course, has, has provided her usual excellent support. And then I know a number of others on staff were involved uh, in the background. So. You know, thank you to all of you for just a, a fabulous job this year. So with that, I will turn it over to Erica. Thank you, Eric. And I, I do want to say thank you as well to the committee members. Um, as Eric alluded to, there was uh, some heavy lifting going on over the summer with making sure that um, the application review was thorough um, and finished on time in order to make sure that this uh, end of the process with budgeting um, was done in time to get grant agreements out at the end of the year. So um, we really appreciate the active engagement of the committee um, and working with staff to, to get this all done on time. So thank you for that. Um, so the, um, the first item on the agenda for eligibility and budget review is the budget revisions and carryover requests. Um, you know, as Eric mentioned, the commission previously discussed this uh, when COVID started um, and when it became apparent that there was going to be a decrease in funding over 50% of IOLTA funds um, decrease in 2021 uh, to have more flexibility with programs um, to allow them to revise their budget, meaning that they can move um, what was previously approved, uh, they can move among line items. And in many cases they were moving um, money from non-personnel expenses to personnel expenses um, and resubmitting the budget. Um, so the commission has expressed uh, being flexible with those revisions as well as um, carryovers, meaning they can take a percentage of their grant award into the next year. Um, and historically, those carryovers would need to be spent down over the, the first two quarters of the following year, but um, the commission uh, agreed to allow a spend down over the whole year. Um, in order to help buffer um, some of the increased uh, need and services and the ability of programs to maintain their staff and um, just to, to make sure that there's a kind of continuity and in funding into the next year. Um, so the uh, Eligibility and Budget Review Committee met this morning to discuss those requests. Uh, they were due last week and staff reviewed them and prepared uh, the spreadsheet that was provided to the commission as well. Um, Anything below 10% um, is automatically approved. Programs didn't need to submit a request. Um, anything between 10 and 25% of their 2020 grant award, um, the Office of Access and Inclusion has discretion to approve those requests. Um, and uh, staff reviewed those and recommended approval of all requests in that, um, in that category. And that was about 34 requests. And then um, there were 33 requests that were above 25% of the grant award, which requires uh, commission review and approval. And so, um, you know, the committee had a discussion this morning about, about those requests. And um, as I told them at that time, there seemed to be a few major themes that emerged um, from the requests that were submitted. One was that, you know, the impact of COVID and um, the impact on operations uh, required programs to sort of adjust on the fly and a lot of them received emergency funding that needed to be spent uh, within this year. And given the commission's uh, previous messaging to allow um, these revisions and carryovers into 2021 uh, organizations planned accordingly. And so um, that led to their requests as well as uh, the decrease in IELTA funding, wanting to make sure that they can uh, maintain their staff uh, with the increase in demand for services that um, has already started and is anticipated to continue. So um, the committee looked into these. There were uh, a few requests, uh, about six requests that were above 50% of the grant award, um, which um, is historically higher than what would typically be approved. But again, given the unique circumstances of this year, um, after uh, looking at those requests, the committee recommended approval. And so, um, the committee voted to recommend approval of all requests that were above 25% uh, of the grant award. Um, and so that is the recommendation to the commission as well. Um, if the commission concurs with the committee's uh, 
recommendation. Very Erica, good. Can I add? Can I add a little? Please. Little more? Um, so th there was a, a pretty um, healthy, robust discussion at the um, committee level in terms of um, approval of the carryover amounts, and, and not so much for this year, because I think we're all in agreement that we message to programs that we be flexible, and we want to be flexible given all the challenges of COVID. Um, however, there, there is something that staff would like to note, um, and we noted to the committee, we'd like to note for the commission is that um, next year, um, it's hard to anticipate how many of these um, carryover requests from programs, um, these programs will have um, high carryover requests again. So then becomes a little bit more of a policy um, discussion in that um, if you're allowing a program to carry over a large amount this year, and then next year they come back and they also have a request for a large carryover, would you approve it? Or would you um, uh, rather, or would you require them to return the funds so that they, um, the funding would be distributed um, through the IELTA formula? So that that is a, a kind of a, a forward thinking policy discussion that we wanted to, to note for you um, and that we would encourage the commission um, to kind of think through um, whether your leading would be to approve or not to approve um, as programs go to budget for the following year, that information will be valuable for them. So what staff suggested to the committee um, is that hopefully we can come up with some analysis um, so that um, in the February commission meeting, um, February, 2021, um, that you can pass some type of motion to indicate to programs um, whether you would again be flexible or whether those larger carryover amounts would not be approved. That would help um, programs in, in their budgeting um, immensely for the next upcoming year. With respect to this, uh, today's motion, it was specific to this year and specifically with respect to the emergency caused by COVID. Yes, and the, the, the motion, this, and let me um, pull up, Erica, should I, the motion you gave me this morning didn't include the new language, right? Do you have the new language of the motion? Um, hold on, let me, let me I share. I don't have it added to the PowerPoint. I think Dan has uh, the exact Dan, language. Dan, yeah, Dan. let me uh, pull up the um, vote tally. Uh, and here it is. The tally was... We actually want the motion, the wording of the motion. Mm -hmm. uh, right, uh, but I, I have it on the, the vote tally. Um, I just have to find the right one. This is lots of billion budgets and and while Dan is looking for that, I yeah. think it's also important to note that um, there was a discussion about the PPPs okay. and mm -hmm. the the uh, payment or repayment of those those loans and what will that actually mean in the long run for these programs? So we're we're taking that into consideration as we're looking at um, 2021, and I think it's not uh, so much a policy change, uh, right, Duan? It's more of a recommendation um, as we're being flexible for uh, next year. Is that correct? Yeah, so, so just something to, to, to kind of think about for next year, because um, we do predict that there will probably be large carryover requests again. So then it would be a decision of the, the commission um, to let programs carry over and save that and, and in effect act like um, a short reserve, or rather it's better um, for the community um, is to not approve the carryover request, have it come back and redistributed through the formula. Um, so that, that's just us kind of thinking forward a little bit. Um, and if there's an indication for programs, again, that, that would help them plan for next year. I have the language. Please, Dan. It's, uh, all revisions and carryovers approved as memorialized on the spreadsheet in the meeting materials and as deferred to the commission for expenditure over the full year due to the COVID-19 emergency. That was uh, written on the fly. But that's exactly what we said. Great. So, um, Eric and Erica, do you need us to uh, move and vote? We do. At this point? Great. We need to vote, yes. yes. Unless there's more so, comments or questions. Are there any other comments or questions? Well, if there are commissioners that think of any additional information or analysis that you would like provided um, in advance of the February meeting, um, then just, just let us know. Great. All right. So um, do I have someone to move? So moved, Bob Thank Plantold. You. Thank, Thank you, you Bob. Bob. And second? I'll second. Thank you, Eric. Would you Thank like you. to do a roll call vote? Yes. Dawn? Bonachet? Yes. Eric? Yes. 
Amin. I think Amin is gone now. Kim Bartelson. Luis. Yes. Pamela. Yes. Catherine. Yes. Will. Yes. Erica. Yes. Herman. Yes. Rebecca. Corey. Yes. Zahira. Yes. Jim. Yes. Deborah. Yes. Bob. Yes. Rich. Yes. Kim Savage. Yes. Chris. Christina. Yes. Uh, unanimous. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, you everyone. 16, Dan, you have 16? Uh, yes, I do. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, great. Um, Erica, Erica and Eric, would you like to continue? Yeah, so we also have on the agenda uh, the need to approve the budget submissions for the 2021 grantees. So Erica, why don't you just briefly overview that one? Um, so after the application process over the summer, um, the commission ultimately found 101 organizations eligible for funding. Um, and they were <clears throat> uh, provided with their tentative allocations uh, shortly thereafter at the end of August. Um, we received back their budget proposals um, at the end of September. And um, of the 101 organizations that were given a tentative allocation, we received 100 budget proposals. Um, one organization after um, receiving its allocation declined its award and that was um, Heart LA. So that funding will be um, held on to for uh, to be rolled into the funding for next year. Um, but of the other 100 budget proposals that were received, um, staff reviewed them and elevated anything that uh, maybe deviated from the recommended um, allocations, the guidelines that we give programs in terms of uh, budgeting for personnel versus non-personnel expenses or program versus um, administration, um, as well as uh, the committee reviewing for um, making sure that the funds are being used for, for qualified uh, purposes. So, um, you know, something that uh, was elevated to the committee was, um, for example, funding a social work position um, and I think Erica may have frozen. She yeah. has. If yeah. there's someone oh. else can jump in. Oh. Um, I can jump in. Um, so as I was going to say, there, there, um, we, we, staff does an initial review and then we elevate to the committee um, any any questionable budgets. And one of the ones that Eric was um, talking about was a program that was um, uh, um, uh, using social workers. Um, and ultimately, um, the committee decided to approve um, the recommendation of, of that because there was, um, and you know, this is an unwritten policy, but the office practice has been, um, we allow programs um, to engage in social work if there's a nexus um, with the legal outcome. And so that program was able to demonstrate it in that specific um, instance. And so um, it was approved, but those are the types of, of, of issues that get flagged um, for the committee for uh, um, deeper review. And the, you know, um, usually with a budget um, applications, there aren't that many um, uh, uh, questions. It's not like at the eligibility level, they're very technical. We're able to resolve the vast majority of them at the staff level. And in some years, this particular um, meeting um, at the committee level is canceled. This year we had it because there were two or three issues, uh, but we're again, able to resolve it. Um, and so the recommendation from the committee would be to approve all budget submissions. And I have the motion um, uh, before you. Um, so the motion reads, um, um, resolve that the Legal Service Trust Fund Commission approves the Eligibility and Budget Review Committee recommendation to approve all 2021 IELTS and EF budget submissions. And what this would practically mean is um, once you approve um, next week, um, uh, we, our office will work to um, release those grant agreements. Um, they officially get released December 1st and programs have a couple weeks to submit them. And then we work to release the checks um, in January. Great. I will so Great. move. 
Thank you, Corey. Do I have a second? Second. Second. No. Was that Pamela? Pam. Pam. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> You guys are okay. you guys are jumping to it. All right, let's uh, let's go ahead and have a roll call vote, please. Bonache? Yes. Eric? Yes. Amin? Kim Bartelson? Luis? Yes. Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Will? Yes. Erica? Yes. Herman? Yes. Rebecca, Corey, yes. Zahira, yes. Jim, uh, yes, but I think I need to abstain from the public law center grant, and I screwed up my last vote. I should have abstained for them too. Oh, we we have you for them for everything, but yes, thank you, um, Jim. Okay, thanks. Deborah, yes. Bob, yes. Rich. Yes. Kim, Kim Savage? Yes. Chris, Christina? Yes. Did, did we hear from uh, Amin or Kim Bartleson? No, I have 16, Dan. Okay. Uh, Amin is, is uh, off now, but Kim has said yes, and it's in the chat if you see that Kim oh, Bartleson has said, oh, yes. said yes. Oh, I didn't see that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So and 17 then. Okay. Great, so the motion passes. Motion passes. Do you have 17, Dan? Yes, I do, 17. Great, motion passes, Bonache. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Zahira has a question and then we'll go to the reports on programs uh, next. Please, Zahira. Thank you so much. Um, I have, the, my question kind of goes back to um, the last question regarding abstentions. And so I know that for some of these, they've come to us repeatedly. And for the ones we just voted on, um, I also voted on them in the committee level and abstained with respect to Disability Rights California. Should I be voicing that abstention every time we vote on it? Or does the first one um, kind of carry through? And if so, I'd like to abstain with respect to the last two motions. But I just wanted to get a little bit of clarification on that if possible. If you could voice it at every, um, every motion, that, that would be helpful for us. Um, but if, if we know that you forgot, like Jim, we know public law center, that's why we do it through, um, but it's helpful for us so that we don't miss it. Okay, thank and you. That was uh, DRC, right? Yes, thank you. Thank yeah, you. and I have to um, I have to do some abstentions to you. Thank you, Sierra, for reminding me about it. Um, uh, CRLA, CRLAF, and work safe, please. Thank you, Corey. And we used to pass around um, a list. Um, and you know, we were told that that was not necessary anymore. But let, let me confer with Brady and see how next year we should handle um, abstentions. And th that list really did help. And um, it, it supported this kind of uh, confusion as well. So um, if we can, we can revive that, that would be great. Uh, okay, so um, let's go to uh, C, a report on programs found ineligible. Erica, are you back? If not, I can I can do the report. I am back, okay, yes. Great. Um, so uh, in this um, year's application, we received uh, seven new applicants or not currently funded applicants. Um, we held eligibility review conferences with six of those applicants um, and ultimately the committee and then the commission uh, recommended that uh, five found be to be found ineligible for, for funding this year. And so um, we uh, sent those determination letters um, out to programs in August um, and they had 30 days to respond and we haven't received any, um, any responses appealing or contesting those decisions. And so, um, yeah, that's, uh, we haven't, yeah, I, I think it speaks to the process and uh, the thoroughness of the eligibility review conferences and um, the committee and commission's uh, participation in that to uh, ensure that um, you know those who were found ineligible this year are um, that there was a, a strong basis for that finding. So. 
And, and we just really want to um, extend a special thanks to um, the committee members that um, that participate in the eligibility review conference. We know that this year there was just a lot more process, a lot more memos, a lot more um, kind of a paper trail um, for all of our um, ineligible determinations. But I think it does speak um, to the fact that it was a really good process um, and that was that we didn't have any appeals because as we all know, it's, it's very time consuming um, and resource intense um, to, 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 you know, to not have to go through that process. So. And, and to thank um, Erica too for leading us in, in, in kind of organizing all the eligibility review conferences and, and, and really taking the charge on the IELTS and um, EF application review process this year. Yeah, I, I think if I can echo the work of the staff this last year, you guys make us look smart. Um, on the commission commission side, you know all the work that you guys put together, all the all the the memos that you're writing. I, I don't even know how you're doing it because there are only 24 hours in a day. So thank you guys for all of the work that you've done this last year as we're leading into the next and um, and for the the commission members on. Um, this subcommittee really uh, led by Eric. Thank you guys for all the work that you've, you've put in. I know it was double duty, um, but really it, it, it served. And um, I think, I don't know, I'm always excited when, when the grant dollars go out, but especially so this year, given um, everything that's uh, happening. So I'm thrilled that the, the organizations will be receiving their checks in January. All right, so if there's nothing more here, let's move forward to partnership grants, Crystal and Christina. Thank you, Ban Um, So I just wanted to introduce myself um, to, to those new to the call. My name is Crystal Bending. I'm actually the new committee coordinator for the Partnership Grants Committee. Uh, the chair of this committee is uh, Christina Vanarelli. I just wanted to provide an overview of the committee and, and this discretionary grant. So the equal access uh, funds are allocated to the Judicial Council and administered by the State Bar through the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission. 10% of those EAF funds are reserved for joint projects of courts and legal services programs to make assistance available to pro per litigants. So those partnership grants are discretionary and awarded through a competitive uh, process. They are one year grants. Uh, the committee consists of five voting members and two advisors who are responsible with reviewing proposals to ensure adherence to eligibility requirements, selection criteria and existing policy before making funding recommendations to the commission. Uh, the 2021 applications were submitted in March, uh, reviewed during the summer and recommended. Uh, recommendations were finalized in August. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and segue to the first agenda item. We have two um, on the agenda, which is the first one is 4A regarding um, uh, recommend recommendations regarding Santa Clara laws Catherine and George Alex, it's a mouthful. So Santa Clara, I will call them for short. Um, I'll provide an overview and then Duan, if you can provide the um, proposed um, motion language on the screen, that would be great. Um, so just for an overview, um, as a reminder for the 2021 um, grant year, um, the Commission met in, on August 14 and the Judicial Council met on September 24th. Um, following that meeting, 35 projects were approved for uh, 2021 partnership grant funding for a total of about 2.4 million. So during the course of a standard monitoring visit in September, it was discovered that Santa Clara Law's uh, 2021 project proposal uh, was not reviewed by the committee due to a technical error on Smart Simple. We investigated the issue with Smart Simple who, who attributed this to uh, a miscoding. Um, and um, unfortunately, uh, the project was quoted as, as a 2020 project and not included in the 2021 list. Um, I think Smart Simple also said it was, it was uh, due to a, a cash issue. So um, keeping in mind several factors, uh, first off, Santa Clara did submit a timely application before the March 16 um, deadline. Um, let's see. And uh, we, we also informed um, Chair uh, Christina Vanarelli as well as Maniha from Judicial Council um, of, of this, um, of this uh, error. Um, because the grant funds were distributed and uh, were approved at the September um, Judicial Council meeting, um, we had, uh, staff has also identified reserved funds to cover the the, um, grant award uh, who had proposed about 60,000. So um, the memo that is attached to this agenda item just kind of outlines those steps that we sought to, to remedy this to, remedy this issue because you know the fault of this error was not due to um, it was not attributed to Santa Clara at all. So uh, what we did was we mirrored the grant review process but on an expedite, expedited timeline. Uh, first off Santa Clara was provided an opportunity to provide uh, update its application um, to provide any updates from COVID-19 in response to COVID-19. Um, we also formed an ad hoc review team to uh, review the process um, and um, the recommendation um, was presented um, at the committee meeting 
this morning. Um, it would, I did want to note that the recommended amount of 58868 does reflect about a 1.89 um, decrease, which other programs in 2021 uh, received. And we just thought the review team, team thought it would be equitable to also give the um, Santa Clara the same decrease. So um, the agenda, or sorry, the proposal is on the screen. Um, if approved, the recommendation will be brought before the Judicial Council at its January meeting. Um, Santa Clara will revise its budget as needed and um, provide any documentation um, similar to our other grantees before any funds are distributed. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Crystal. Any questions or comments? Okay, hearing none. Uh, do I have a motion? Is that approval? Catherine, was that was that you? Moving? Catherine, like more. Okay, thank you. And Luis, was that you seconding? Yeah. Okay. okay. So we have a second from Luis, and um, so shall we move on with the roll call vote? Duan, will you carry that? Duan, you're muted. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Banache? Yes. Eric? Yes. Amin? Kim Bartleson? Kim Bartleson? Luis? Kim just said yes. Oh, Kim just said In okay. the chat, yeah. Must be. Okay. Luis? Yes. Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Will? Yes. Erica? Yes. Herman? Yes. Rebecca? Corey? Yes. Zahira? Yes. Jim? Yes. Deborah? Yes. Bob? Bob just yes. typed yes as well. Rich? Yes. Kim? Yes. Chris? Christina? Yes. I have 17, Dan. I have 17. Great. Motion passes. Wonderful. Okay, thank you. Um, would you would you ladies like to continue? Sure, I'll go ahead. <laughs> sure. So item 6B, which is review and approve proposed rubric for the 2022 partnership grants. As you can see, there was no linked memo um, to this agenda item. Um, after looking at the preliminary um, rubric that um, staff had developed, I, we, we decided to kind of have a discussion on the committee level um, about the preliminary rubric, and we got some really great feedback from the committee. So um, at this point, um, there, there will be, be uh, we don't require a vote for this action. We'll present it at the um, ad hoc uh, commission meeting. Uh, we do have a, a few kinks to work out and make sure that it addresses um, addresses the needs as identified from the Board of Trustees directive, as well as um, just reflecting current policies um, that the um, committee carries out um, when reviewing these grants. Great. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you, Christina. Thank you both. Thank you. Okay. Um, bank. Uh, Bank grants, let's go with Kim and Christine. Okay, um, at the result of our meeting today, we have two items to present to the commission. The first is carryovers for programs who did not spend their complete bank grant and uh, many their substantial percentages of their budgets were not spent. Um, Following in our um, current COVID tradition of being flexible, um, the committee approved all of the carryover requests. The um, information is in our agenda materials. There's three pages with very detailed information, including the percentages um, of the carryovers. Um, and you have here a motion, uh, which we passed that we are presenting to the commission. 
um, that be it resolved that the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission approves, oops, can we go back? Thank you, oops, no. back. <laughs> huh. Well, we're getting there. There we go. Uh, the, the Trust Fund Commission approves the Bank Grants Committee recommendation regarding 2020 budget revisions and carryovers. This is not the final one that we passed. We included reference to uh, COVID. We added a phrase. We thought it was very important for bank grant recipients to know that the rationale behind um, carryovers where there were great percentages in one instance of 56% and others that were close to that, um, that we, that was the reason because of COVID. And that is the reason I neglected to say that um, all of the programs articulated, essentially all of the programs articulated as to why they could not spend the money. So this is just in keeping with every other um, budgetary matter that has come forward related to the programs. Um, I think we need at some point, well, somewhat, well, I guess Christine is, is finding the exact resolution language. Um, I'll say that, and then we can go back to it and request the commission's uh, vote in support of it. Um, the other item that we brought up was not anything that needs to be voted on. It's just that at the end of the bank grant cycle, the three-year cycle, um, there is $6 million remaining. And we have just decided at this point for a number of reasons to table any further discussion on what to do with that, with those remaining funds until January or February. Um, while $6 million sounds like a lot of money, when you think about the number of programs that might be eligible for it, it's not a lot. It's an incredible amount of work for the staff to figure out how to, um, you know, basically how to distribute it, how to, you know, whether there's another RFP or what happens. Um, and because we're, it's an old refrain at this point, but, you know, we're uncertain what's going on with budgets um, and future funding, we just decided to table any further discussion on that remaining six million until potentially we have more information in January or February. Um, that's essentially it from Banks Committee. I just would like to see if we could get up that um, resolution. Um, and then Christine might have some more detailed information to present, I'm not sure. Uh, and, and very quickly uh, yeah. on this point, I think Catherine Blakemore has a question. So, so I, thank you. Oops. Sure. Please. I just noted, thank you, Bonache. I, I, I noticed that there was a notice, I think I'm looking at the right document that said legal assistance for seniors and the, the note was not to approve or disapprove, but to get more information. Okay, so, yes. And yes, thank, thank you for bringing that up, Catherine. And hi, and welcome. Thank thrilled you. to have you. <laughs> We're totally thrilled. <laughs> um, we did discuss that. And at the point when this was prepared, um, there wasn't sufficient information, but staff is now satisfied. And Christine can, or Dwan can give you the details on that. I don't, I don't have that exactly. Christine, if you can give me the, the, um, the uh, hey. language of the motion. Okay. Yes. I just, okay. Um, say it to me so I can type it in. I'm sorry. Is, is this it? Yeah, this yeah, is it. This okay. is it. Do you want me to read it? Hold on, let me go from okay. And then is that now? That's it. Okay, that's it. Uh yes. Okay. Uh, so before, all... we, before we vote on the motion though, um perhaps let's get an answer for Catherine on uh seniors. Which I don't have. I think staff has. Christine? Uh, yes, I do. They they did send a response. Um, but if you just give me one one minute, I'm sorry. I, I'm actually satisfied. It was just, it, there was nothing there. So I just wanted to make sure that, that it had been, the staff had recommended approval. So I, I don't need any more information, specific information. 
Yeah, the staff recommendation was approval, Catherine. Um, at the time that we went, we have a posting deadline um, that we have to meet. And so the pro program had not provided additional information um, at that time. And then in addition, um, the, the, the fake grant committee meeting was right before this meeting. So when we post for the committee level, we post for the commission and then we provide an oral update. And that's why we don't have the, the new language. That 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 phrasing was added um, just, just hours ago. No, no problem. Thank you for the clarification. So before I read the resolution, I just want to um, give a big thank you to staff and Christine in particular. I mean, if you just look at this three page matrix and think about what it took <laughs> to create this, the attention to detail, I um, mean, we're really indebted and very lucky to have uh, staff be able to develop information in an accurate way and then equally important convey it in a way that it's understandable so thank you very much the resolution is should the legal services uh, resolve due to challenges brought on by covid19 that the legal services trust fund commission approves the bank grants committee recommendation regarding uh, 2020 budget revisions and carryover requests very good Thank you. Um, do I have someone who would like to move? I'll move. I'll second it. Okay, that was Luis and Herman as a second. Thank you so much. Okay, um, Bonache? Yes. Eric? Yes. Amin? Kim Bartleson? Kim has said yes again. Great, thank you. Luis? Yes. Pamela? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Will? Yes. Erica? Yes. Herman? Yes. Rebecca? Corey? Yes. Zahira? Yes. Jim? Yes. Deborah? Deborah? Yes, I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. Thank you, Deborah. Mm -hmm. Bob? Yes. Rich? Yes. Kim Savage? Yes. Chris? Christina? Yes. Seventeen, Dan. Seventeen. Great. A motion passes. Great. Thank you. And um, the second part of that for updates for potential twenty twenty two requests for proposal. I think Kim's provided that that update on um, Bonnachet that the Bay Grant Committee is holding off on further discussions of our RFP. Very good. Thank you. All right. We're moving on. Um, Administrative activities. Bonnachie, may I say yes, something in regards yes, to that committee? One of the things that we discussed that Rich brought up was that a lot, and I mentioned it to the gentleman early, that a lot of the legal aid um, organizations don't have adequate resources to compete, and therefore they're generally understaffed. And I think Selena had some ideas, and Selena, if I may call upon you to share with the full commission the things that you shared in our um, committee. Uh, about the recruitment retention issues right retention yeah. issues sorry i have a lot of background noise in my home um <laughs> briefly there were no children in my home and it was quiet and now they're back um yeah so i had raised in the, in the subcommittee meeting just a discussion of the fact that if the legal services trust fund commission is really interested in the fact that there are frequently carryovers due to the inability to hire um a lot of the times that inability inability to hire is is based on um, legal aid organizations relatively low pay compared to government attorneys or other other um, employment and, and this is not just an attorney issue it's also for social workers and other staff um, who may work at legal nonprofits or other you know in academia or in, in government places where they could perhaps get a much higher wage in other placements um, so I thought that if the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission was interested in engaging in this issue that you know LAC would be happy to help you know gather some folks maybe there could be a presentation 
because um, the California Commission on Access to Justice has a, something called the Rural Task Force that Jim and I sit on. And we did a, a presentation to the State Bar Board of Trustees a few years ago, and we frequently go back to talk about this issue um, because we talk about rural attorney deserts and how hard it is to hire attorneys there and the need to have some consistent statewide loan repayment assistance program. Um, and you know, we've worked with, LAC has worked with the State Bar's Office of Access and Inclusion, specifically with Elizabeth Hom on this issue. Um, but there are multiple ways that we could look at the problem of low pay, that until organizations are able to pay their, their staff more, which is a, is a long a road um, involving grants and contracts and everything else, um, we could look to see if we could fund a loan repayment assistance program statewide. Um, so if the commission's interested in this topic, I'm very happy to, to get, gather some folks. Um, I can work with Elizabeth Hom on all the research she's done in the past on the existing program. Because um, it's it's a ripe issue, uh, you know, it, it's challenging now to hire in a pandemic, but it's going to be challenging once the economy starts improving and people um, continue to leave legal aid organizations just for the salary. You know, they may love the work, but they leave for the salary. Rich, did you want to say anything? Because you're the one that brought it up when we were meeting in the um, committee. I, I think it's an opportunity for the commission to make a policy statement uh, to the board of trustees. Uh, to then carry the ball, perhaps with the legislature, to think of a methods, means by which uh, we can enhance the take-home pay of legal service workers. Um, I, I mentioned to Herman that I'd written a, a, a policy paper on increasing judicial salaries by expanding parsonage to cover judges, and uh, it didn't draw a great public response. Uh, but I think the same thing ought to be considered for those who are seeking to bring justice uh, to the poor. Uh, and since the, the salary levels are so low, we are finding um, it, it surfaces for the commission because we have carryover grants. And the reason we have carryover grants is because there's not enough staff to undertake the work that we're funding. So this is a serious problem. It's a systemic problem. We can't get the legislature to somehow vote more money for these people. So maybe we can give them a tax break. There was some discussion perhaps about giving them student loan breaks. Uh, that may unfortunately focus the, the carry, the load on too narrow a base. So my idea was to spread it amongst all taxpayers uh, by giving them a tax break on the income they earn in doing this great work. Anyhow, I, I think we can take a position on that we have the moral high ground, uh, if not the financial high ground. That's really great. Um, Zahira has a point. Rich, just before we, we go to Zahira, this is um, a subject actually that came up with the good folks at COAF. And if you recall, Ryan mentioned something uh, to this at the top of our meeting. So this might be an opportunity to, to um, combine efforts uh, in supporting, because we know many of the, the, the lawyers um, who are out there working in this space are lawyers of color. Um, so this, this could be a, an opportunity to, to collaborate there. Zahira, please. Oh, thank you. Um, and I just, I think on that, that piece in terms of collaboration, um, it does seem as if there are lots of opportunities. I, I also just wanted to, um, and I know we're, we're gonna get to this uh, further down on the agenda, but the comment I had earlier in terms of the justice gap study and some of the work around that, I mean, this was one of, I think one of the recommendations or one of the pieces that were lift, was lifted up in that study. And so I, I just also wonder how we can um, sort of, with some of these efforts, hinge it back to that work so that it feels really, um, so that from the this, this study and the report, we get some action steps um, that move forward, but that they're grounded um, in some other work that we can continuously go back and refresh, which um, I'll, I'll speak more about why um, I'm, I'm interested in seeing more in terms of having that justice gap study um, and the justice gap work, part of the work plan, fully appreciating a lot of the limitations, but much of it is because of what was already just expressed, is that we are still in a moment, um, and Selena said it so eloquently, in terms of what this means right now, in terms of lawyers coming in and out of the profession. Um, and if we, if we wait, then we're going to be um, further back um, once we're through this than we would be if we were continuing the momentum that we've already built from the relationships that and all the good thinking that's already come 
together around the study and some other efforts. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of make that comment since we're on part of this flow right now. Thank you. Thank you, Zahira. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Any other comments? Yeah, just a question. Like all of this is good conversation, but where does it go from here? I mean, what do what do we or what can we do to keep it to take it to the another another step rather than just conversation? Well, I, I think if I could just jump in, I think one of the 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 first steps is maybe Dwan from our side and Elizabeth from the COAF side can help put together um, and arrange a, a meeting so that we can we can begin to talk about this further. Selena, if you could join um, that as well as, as anyone else that you think that needs to be part of that discussion. Um, and I think I think you know the, the point that Zahira is making is a is an excellent one, um, as always Zahira. Uh, that that this is a, this is a a time to look at the justice gap as well. If if we're not going to fully focus on it, then maybe at least we say that this is which it is coming from that study, um, and putting some feet under it, which is what Herman is is pointing to. So we're going to, so the staff is going to put something together for us to take a look at. Is that what I'm hearing you say? I, that's what I'm, I'm um, suggesting. And I know how much is, is before the staff. So I don't want to overstep uh, that that's the, that's the, you know, it's, it's the balance. Okay. If I can make a suggestion, because I, I think we're um, segueing into the work plan um, discussion anyways. And, and so um, perhaps we can talk about the work plan. <clears throat> we don't, uh, originally we were going to um, uh, make a, um, ask to, for you to make a motion to approve it, but perhaps um, we can go through it and maybe bring it back for December um, to approve if we wanted to modify a couple bullet points. Shall, shall we go to the work plan, Bonache? Let's do, please. Okay. So let me share my screen and pull up the work plan. Sorry, give me a minute to open up the work plan. Can, can you see my screen and the work plan? Okay, so the work plan was providing your meeting materials. And as you'll see, um, the work plan is very, very similar, almost identical um, to last year's work plan because the work of this commission um, is cyclical and it follows our grants calendar. Um, so much of the work is the compliance work. Um, the first page is just kind of the charge of the trust fund um, commission. Um, the second page is where it begins the work plan. And uh, most of this is core kind of business. Um, uh, the first section um, has to do with IOLTA and EF grant awards, um, reviewing and approving the application awards, um, carryover and bu budget modifications. Um, the second um, the section is partnership grants, um, the same reviewing and approving the awards and um, reviewing and approving carryover budget modifications, um, similar to um, homelessness prevention grants and similar to um, bank grant awards. Um, so that, that's all kind of core, um, core business functions. Um, we move down. Um, this I, I want to flag um, for your review because this is actually a new item that's being added to this work plan. Um, so uh, there was legislation um, that, that was um, approved um, not long ago um, for the fee bill. So this upcoming fee bill, um, the legislature has said that um, they will uh, they have approved a, a five an additional five dollar opt out to fund um, provisional licensees in California, um, uh, with the hope that the commission would be distributing um, a, a funding to those uh, provisional licensees. So you know uh, Don and I um, did some number crunching, um, and it seems like we'll probably um, from from the the five dollar opt out. What we predict it will probably fund between um, three and five. Five um, provisional licensees. Um, it's it's going to come to the commission for approval. Um, so we need to figure out um, what kind of body within the committee within the commission will be reviewing the RFP um, applications and will be approving. Um, you know, Elizabeth and I are going to take a stab at drafting the RFP application. We're not envisioning something too complicated. Um, it will be to our IELTA funded organizations most likely. Um, we need to take a look at the legislation. Um, 
but it'll be something very, very um, kind of streamlined, easy for um, a, a programs to fill out. Um, and then um, we'll work with the ex, uh, XCOM um, committee to, to decide whether we need to um, uh, form a, a, another sub entity or whether XCOM takes it on or some delegated body. Um, that would take on the review. So, so this is this is a new addition um, to the work plan this year. Um, the the licensing fee bill um, is going to be released in in January, and then we start collecting um, the money. So the funds are going to be coming pretty quickly. Um, so so that's why the the first deadline um, is is uh, March thirty first, and then we're hoping um, to have the funding go out by the middle of the year. Um, so let me take a pause there. If there are any questions um, around this this addition to the work plan. We're very excited, though, to be able to fund, even though it's 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 not going to be a large amount. Um, it, it's it's still going to be a service to the community. Okay, so let me move on if there are no questions. Um, the next um, um, item is um, reviewing cases in which a grantee's funding may be terminated because of their failure to comply um, with standards and authorities. And um, as you all know, we've been through this um, with several grantees in the last um, couple of years. And um, this, this is part of our um, compliance and our oversight work um, and is built into the work plan every year. Um, another core function is recommending the IELTA distribution that will then go to the Board of Trustees. So we will try to finalize that recommendation at our um, June 25th, um, 2021 um, uh, commission meeting, and then it will go to the Board of Trustees at their July um, 22, um, 2001, um, 2021 meeting. Um, and then this next bullet point is, is the work of the Rules Committee. Um, and this is, this is um, you know, to gather, codify, revise all kind of the decision-making points um, of our grants administration. We have a really ambitious timeline um, and we, we're um, working towards um, packaging it for the board of trustees. And as you heard Amin um, talk earlier, we might be able to pull out um, some of recommendations that are finalized or, and may not um, involve um, having to wait for other recommendations um, and elevating that to the, the, the board of trustees rather than the waiting uh, until the very end. Um, so Amin and I will work through some plan um, to, to, to elevate to um, the commission for your approval. <laughs> the next item, and this is where we should probably spend a, a little bit more time talking about. Um, uh, I'm sorry. So this was attached. This is the, um, the rules committee work. It's, it's, it, it has become our core business, but it is um, related to the state, um, the board of trustees strategic plan, um, a goal one objective C. Um, and then this next section right here, um, and, uh, is, is related to the Board of Trustees um, goal for objective A, which is to support increased funding and enhance outcome measures for legal services. And so as you all know, um, the, the commission has been very involved in the work that our office has done around evaluations. Um, there was a, a formerly a, re a reboot committee um, that worked um, with um, state bar staff um, to really um, redesign our evaluation um, uh, uh, reporting. Um, uh, that work, um, there's, though there's no longer a reboot committee, um, we, the staff will be aggregating and analyzing um, HP evaluation data um, and drafting key findings and outcomes, as well as um, for the bank grant evaluation data. So this it was an extension from last year that we're hoping to carry on into uh, next year um, to present some type of aggregated report um, to present to the commission, as well as the board of trustees, and to share with um, interested stakeholders. And then this is what um, Zahira was talking about in that our um, work plan from last year, um, we had an item to participate in um, task force on justice gap funds. Um, so there is um, uh, legislation um, that provides that um, the, uh, the uh, justice gap funds go through um, go out through IELTA, um, and this task force was just to revisit that um, to see whether um, it kind of that made sense that the IELTA funding should go out through IELTA, or perhaps um, linking it to some need um, that the justice gap uh, report um, identified. So, um, in talking with um, executive staff and um, the director of our office, Andrea and Bonachet, we thought that um, this might be, um, it might be good to, to, um, to, to hold off on, on this particular point um, until the following year, um, but, but we welcome kind of discussion. And, and that's why we left the strike through so that you knew that it was on the work plan formally, um, but that what we're suggesting recommending is, is, is to take it off for the following year. Is this something we can discuss now, or do you want to wait? Are you 
Yeah, we can discuss now. And then the, the, the this last bullet point for this section here is to participate in efforts to increase funding for legal aid grants. And mm. obviously, um, we continue to do that. And this is, again, um, uh, uh, tied to those um, board of trustees strategic plan, but really, I, we see it as a core function of the of trust fund commission. On, on the justice gap, um, I would recommend that we postpone working on it and re remove it from this immediate work plan due to all of the other really high priority tasks, as well as considering whether this is really a good time to be undertaking this, um, even sort of the, ske the skewed environment we're in right now. Um, so I, I would agree um, that we postpone, but not extinguish, just postpone justice gap um, studies now. And, and just a little bit more context also for this bullet point is that, um, you, you know, when we had suggested to include this in the uh, Trust Fund Commission's work plan, this was pre-COVID and this is when interest rates were at a watermark high. And so we thought, you know, if they were that high and we um, redirected some of the that, that funding um, to other kind of worthy um, causes that the justice gap um, identified that, you know, at least we should consider it. And so that was the task force kind of impetus was to do an investigation, a deeper dive to see if that's kind of the direction that we wanted to go in. Not necessarily that that's where we would land, but it was um, fact gathering. But in light of the fact that <clears throat> IOLTA interest rates um, are really low and our revenue stream is low, um, it, it just feels appropriate to, again, not um, delay, not remove it completely from our work right. delay. Thank you. This is Thank Rich. I'd support that. Uh, I think that um, funding is uh, of great concern to all of us. Uh, and the staff is a bit shorthanded as it is. The amount of work that's here is sort of breathtaking. Uh, and I don't know how it can be accomplished. Andrea is just getting her feet on the ground and getting her arms around all this and hiring new staff persons who will be integrated into the programs. I, 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 I support what Kim's just uh, suggested. Are there, Thank any, you. Are there any, any other comments? Sorry. Yes, we have a few in the chat. Um, we have Will asking a question, uh, then Jim, then Catherine in that order, please. I was just uh, uh, unclear what the definition of the task force was. Is it uh, LSTFC created task force or is this yeah. a separate? It, it, it was LSTC, yeah, and a commission task force and what it was going to look like had not been decided. It was just, the, the name was task force, but it could have been called sub, sub entity, could have been called, but it was a task force to look into um, whether some of the justice gap funds should uh, you know, uh, some of the, the IOLTA funding, um, it, it's called justice gap because that's what it's called in the legislation, uh, funding for justice gap, but it's also confusing because we were going to see whether the justice gap study, um, some of the, those recommendations should be funded through the justice gap funds. Uh, Jim, did that answer your question as well? Just a little bit of clarification. So that justice, the task force is completely defined by our commission or is it defined by somebody else? We, it, 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 we hadn't started to talk about what would be, um, but we, yeah, the commission would be um, defining what the task force would look like, but we didn't get far enough to decide who else should be participate in the task force. I think that was open, uh, whether there should be other stakeholders involved, but it, it would have been a project of the trust fund commission and NOAI staff. And I don't know if you recall, this was um, part of that, that presentation that Helen provided um, in terms of the justice gap study that she previewed some of the recommendations. And one of them was to fund internships and perhaps that funding to go could go to support um, internships. Catherine? Are there any yes, Catherine Blakemore has a, has a question. So I think, uh, Duan, when we began this discussion, you, you, I guess I understood it to be was this an opportunity then to talk about the um, sort of salary gap as a piece of the work, which I think it would fit under this goal four as a, as a part of that. My second suggestion is what I think Selena was 
generously offering is that she and I think Jim Meeker could do such a presentation based on some work that they had done before. So as a way of not sort of imposing on additional staff time to, to put something together. And my guess would be that the access um, to Justice Commission that I'm also on would be willing to uh, lend some help with that because it's an area of interest to, to the Access Commission as well. So I guess I would encourage us, I don't know whether it has to formally be within a goal if we're gonna do something. So that's, I'm new, I don't really know how that works, but I think it's a good idea to have a presentation and to just begin to think of opportunities as a corollary to how do you increase funding, how do you increase salaries is um, kind of the, the other side of that. And, and, uh, and just for context too, this work plan does get presented to the Board of Trustees um, at an early uh, January 2020, I, I think it's the January 2021 meeting for them to approve. So we do have one more meeting um, for the commission to approve that. And that's why I suggest, unless somebody has um, a suggestion for language to add in right now, it's sometimes hard to think of a bullet point on the spot that we can, um, staff and, and the executive committee can um, can reconvene and come, come up, uh, uh, present you with, with another version of this. If that's the direction that you want to go, we can bring some some language in advance of the December meeting to add. And and, and Catherine, um, I would um, agree with your recommendation to add it and under um, in in this this section right here for goal four. Perfect. Thank you. I, I support bringing it back. So that's fine. Thank you, Catherine. Zahira, you have a question. If I'm just clear, Catherine, it wouldn't be the task force on justice gap funds, but it would be some iteration of looking into recruitment and retention. Is that Correct. I, I was saying, well, I was trying to figure out where it fit on the work plan. So it seemed like it could fit in goal four. And I wasn't suggesting that it be for the justice gap fund, that it just be sort of a uh, learn about and identify opportunities to work with others to improve, you know, legal aid, look at recruitment and retention issues and legal aid programs and solutions, something like that. Yeah. Yes. And I will use that language as a starting point, Catherine. Thank you. However you want to do it, it's fine. I'm sure we'll get to someplace around that issue. And Bonnie, okay, I'm you. sorry, I apologize. I can't see the, um, the comment box when I'm sharing. Yeah, no problem. Zahira has a question. Thank you. Um, and thank you for, for this discussion. And I think that with respect to the, the task force, um, whether or not that is the specific piece of work, I think is, is open as it hasn't been defined, the degree to work it would involve is unknown because we don't have a defined task force. Um, so the I, I think projecting that it would be a significant amount of work, it's really a bit up to us to figure out like what exactly that scope would entail. I think that um, the piece in terms of how that work is preserved um, and the work that was done with respect to the justice gap study, which the other piece in terms of loan forgiveness and other elements connect back to the work of the study is that that study is still used as a touch point. Um, and so that we're not reinventing the wheel and that we can in the future go back to a phase two, um, but that information, especially with like loan repayment, all of these different pieces are rooted in information that we have. Um, and it is a study that we put out. And if we um, continue to believe in the, the work of the study, then if there are thoughts or projects that relate back to it, then having some connection um, so that even as we're communicating out to the public, the public has a better understanding that this is connected to prior work. Um, and so I would be fully comfortable with something to the um, extent that was just discussed in terms of a conversation around um, some language that has to do with loan repayment um, or what have you and linking it back to the justice gap study. Um, and maybe in next year's work plan, we see a phase two or we start to see the task force or the initial pieces of the task force coming about, but something, some language that is about um, executing on some of the elements of the justice gap study. For example, one piece could be um, pursuing the work around the loan forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you, Zahira. Okay, I, I, so go I ahead, Dawn. Question then, um, in terms of drafting purposes, um, is the commission in agreement um, to hone in on loan repayment, or do we want to keep as broad as recruitment and retention? 
I'm in favor of keeping it broad since I don't know where we're headed. And I really like the suggestion of framing it around the justice gap study because those issues were mentioned in that. And, and I agree that keeping that message, we're, we're looking at ways to implement that is the right, um, is the right approach. So. so at this point, I think uh, now that we're uh, reviving the, the XCOM and having Kim and Rich with their uh, 10 plus years of experience on the commission, plus, 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 um, joining Eric and myself, maybe we have that conversation with you, Duan and Andrea, and we can start to define uh, what that reframing of that language looks like. Because I think it is really important that we're balancing what, we're, what we wanna do um, this next year with all that's in front of the staff. Um, and I think you guys are starting to see some emails coming in you know, at midnight and such. Um, and we don't, you know, that's just not sustainable for this team, for anybody. Uh, so let's see how we can manage uh, the, the as, as Will has said here, the forward momentum um, while balancing, not, uh, you know, uh, burning this, the staff out any further um, than they already probably are. So let's do that. Let's go ahead and take it into the XCOM meeting after uh, the board of trustees, uh, uh, formally uh, approves uh, the, the, the expansion of XCOM and we can discuss it further there and bring it back to you all. Yes, so I, I will coordinate a, a meeting um, after the commission, after the board approves the, the re-expansion of XCOM um, and then we'll do it in advance of the December 15th meeting so that we have something um, to bring back to the full commission. Great. Does that what sound is this, what is this? What is the schedule for the board for its consideration of expanded XCOM? <clears throat> they're meeting uh, the 19th next Thursday, I believe is what the 19th is. Um, and uh, Andrea and I are attending. Um, it, it gets presented at the programs committee first and it, it, we're not the ones presenting it. Christine, the access liaison who's on our, in our meeting today is also the appointments liaison and she has already um, presented, um, a, 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 there's a memo that's drafted that's being posted literally I think today or yesterday at, at the board of trustee at the state bars website that once it's up then I can circulate it to everybody um, with the recommendations from the appointments liaisons to have Jeff um, appointed as a public member and then to expand the XCOM um, with Eric Yu being a co-chair and Kim and Rich being co-vice chairs. Um, that agenda item will then go on consent to the full board of trustees. And are you guys gonna define what justice gap phase two is? So uh, justice gap phase two, I don't know if you'll recall was, um, it was going to be an iteration of justice gap one study, but conducted in five languages. And so the state bar thought that because of COVID, um, they were going to compare the, the findings from, um, you know, uh, the participants um, in the five languages versus um, the ones that filled out the first study. But because of COVID-19, um, there's not gonna be a, a fair comparison. And so that's why um, that study has been um, decided to be put on hold. Good. And that might not, and that and that might not be in that iteration, as Andrea was saying. Um, I, I think there's some strategic planning at the executive level that um, uh, Andrea is participating in to see whether we even move forward um, with that iteration, even once COVID is over, or whether we we scrap it and pursue Justice Gap two in some other iteration. Okay. Arne Shea, would this be a good place to ask a question about the about the executive committee, or should that wait for later? Well, actually, we're going into administrative activity, so we're we're almost there. Um, if if we're complete uh, with uh, with this portion, yeah. Are there any other questions? If you have further thoughts, then just feel free to um, email me. If you have um, language, or if you want um, other items to be added around this work plan, um, usually, like I said, it's it's pretty routine. But because we are expanding some of our work, um, it does warrant um, a more more discussion. Um, so, and we're not taking a vote today, so we, we will come back to you on December 15th with a, with a, a new proposal. Okay, very good. Um, Herman, please go ahead yes. with your question. If I understand it correct, it's you, Eric, Rich, and Kim are gonna make up the executive committee. Is that correct? That's correct. So okay. Rich, and, Rich and Eric from Southern California okay. and Kim and myself from Northern California. Okay. And then if I read um, what the commission is made up of, it's made up of 15 lawyers, six non-lawyers and three, three judges. And it, uh, just for further consideration, if there are six non-lawyers, would it be possible in the future that one of those non-lawyers be on the executive committee 
just to give a different perspective that a non-lawyer would give. If the non-lawyers make up 28% of the commission, but when you look at the executive committee, it's 100% lawyers. Yes, okay, well, I, I absolutely. Just, I, I just throw that out there no, for that's, consideration. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great point. And we we have had exactly what you're speaking to in the past. And Jeff is shaking his head um, with the, the affirming that. So we, we have had that, um, definitely. The how, only how, how was the decision made to have four <laughs> lawyers and no non-lawyers? This time? Yes. Do you mean this time? So for this time, what we were looking at, given what we're, we're, we're embarking upon, um, what we just came out of, and this next year, potentially year and a half, uh, God willing, not that long, uh, that what we wanted to do is we wanted to fill the executive committee with people who have had the long history of getting us through the first financial crisis and we're part of it and to get us through the next one, which is one of the reasons why we asked Jeff to come back. Yeah. So we're, we, all we're doing is, is pulling from everyone's experience and expertise at this point, um, you know, where Jim is able to bring in his expertise on all of the great work he's doing and so on. So that's, that was the thinking behind it. And, Sometimes. but our objective, sorry, Herman, but our objective has always been to, um, to develop and grow leadership um, for, for the future on this commission. And one of the ways that we do that is by rotating the chair positions and then that having that be part of the training and then moving them into the vice chair positions and then into the chair positions. Yeah. And that's across the board. So it's not a lawyer centric decision. Can I talk about the process? Cause I think that's what Herman Absolutely. Is sure. Sure. So th this um, recommendation, Herman, is, is being done a little, it's out of process because typically what happens every year, um, our um, uh, our appointments get made at the July Board of Trustees meeting. Um, I'm sorry, at the, the, at the uh, September, I'm sorry, at the August um, Board of Trustees meeting and then goes into effect in September for the new term. Um, so there was a whole slate of uh, nominations that already occurred earlier this year. Eric was reappointed, Amin was reappointed um, and, and so forth. We had one opening that we saved specifically for a public member because we wanted to recruit somebody um, with financial expertise and banking expertise. And so we we did, that was a conscious decision to leave one opening um, on, on the trust fund commission. And like um, Bonashe was saying, we um, heavily recruited for Jeff to come back because he had uh, so much expertise um, in, in banking um, to fill that position. But normally what happens and what will happen in 2021 um, is that um, there's an email that comes uh, goes out um, from me to the, the whole um, commission that will ask, is anybody interested in being um, a, 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 to submit interested in being um, a, a chair or a vice chair, um, please um, submit your, your statements of interest. The commission um, doesn't decide um, uh, uh, um, officer positions. Um, that's all centralized at the state bar and the appointments liaisons are the ones that make a recommendation um, to the board of trustees um, for officer positions as well as 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 as, as uh, commission positions on the trust fund um, commission. Um, they work with staff. Um, uh, we provide some context, some recommendations, but ultimately it's the appointments liaisons that, that make that recommendation. Um, you know, we at, at the at the commission level, um, once there are statements of interest that come through, I email them out to everybody. Um, and, and some years you have passed a motion to support that that a, a, a nominee, and then I pass that along to the appointments liaisons to let them know. Because it happened out of cycle this year, um, there was just talk amongst several commissioners that thought that um, it made sense to re-expand um, the ex, um, XCOM. They submitted those statements of interest to me, and then I shared that with the appointments liaison, and the appointments liaison are now making that recommendation to the Board of Trustees. And that's why it feels, a, it, 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 because it is out of cycle this year. Yeah. It, I, I, I don't care who is on it. I just think that when you look at stuff, a fresh set of eyes. I know Vanishe said that people who have experience, but sometimes a fresh set of eyes may see things that others don't see. The other piece for me, if those of us who aren't lawyers are asked to participate, but when, the, when you make these decisions about the executive committee, it appears that we are not even considered or the process if we make up at least 28% of, of the commission, it sounds logical that if there's a four person 
uh, executive that one of the six of us should have an opportunity to participate in the executive committee, which brings a different perspective. And I'm assuming that's why non some of us who are non lawyers are asked to participate, bringing that different perspective. Definitely, your point is completely well taken, Herman. Um, as I said, we have in the in the past, and we will uh, going forward. Now that we've re-expanded out as well, there, there's uh, four seats as opposed to the two seats um, to fill. And so, absolutely, that's a, that's an absolute. Um, it, on this point as well, we used to have a another subcommittee that was um, a nomination subcommittee uh, that that we're we're looking at in in some way revising and having it more as a as a recruiting and retention uh, subcommittee because nominations are at the at the board of trustees level um, as Duan mentioned and that's part of the not only part of the the training and development and leadership um, for, for our future leaders on the commission but also to recruit new uh, commission members because as, as you all know, we all term out um, unless there's a there's a, a an opportunity to continue to serve. But um, so that's that's an that's a space that um, we I would love to have as many voices, and of course I think everyone would love to have as many voices um, involved in that subcommittee. Okay, does that um, does that answer? Your question, Herman. Should we move on? We can move on, but it doesn't answer the question. <laughs> okay, we could talk more about it. We can definitely talk more about it. Um, so, moving on to the uh, 2021 administrative activities, Duan. Uh, yes, so we, we just did um, uh, agenda item A, so we'll move on to agenda item B, which is the review of committee assignments. So, let me pull it up and share my screen. Um, so, so these are um, the new assignments um, for uh, at the committee level, and more or less they've they've stayed the same. Um, like uh, Bonashay and I uh, mentioned earlier, that we've been having um, phone calls um, with commissioners um, to kind of check in. We're still making our way through the list, but we've been hearing a lot of feedback that. Um, Commissioners are feeling um, that the workload is very heavy on the commission, um, and and some 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 commissioners have asked to um, um, be moved off of committees and maybe only have one committee or two committees instead of um, two or three. Um, so there you'll see that type of adjustment. Um, the chair positions have remained um, the same, with the exception of um, Erica Connolly is um, replacing um, Eric Iskin um, to be the chair of the Eligibility and Budget Review Committee. Um, but these these are the assignments. Um, if if you're on multiple committees and we haven't had a phone call with you, but you feel um, overwhelmed or overstretched, um, please contact me. Um, this this um, this com the committee's assignments do not need to be um, formally voted and approved. We have commissioners um, cycling on on and off um, depending on your availability. So so we can definitely be accommodating to your schedule. Um, and I've also listed the the staff um, committee coordinator for each of those um, subcommittees. So are there are any questions about the committee assignments? So I just had a, a quick, I'm very interested in the structure and uh, I love rules. So um, I don't think we can change this, but we can still attend as co commission members, oh, the yeah, committees, absolutely. like the rules. Absolutely. You, you're welcome to attend um, as in all members of the public, any of um, our, our committee meetings. And just, you can just let us know because if we know that there's actually a commissioner attending, we'll elevate you so that you can like more actively participate. There are badly keen rules in terms of like um, the voting and, and so forth um, and, 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 and you know prohibition. But yes, yes, we welcome you. And, and, and especially for the rules committee, if you're interested, we'd love to have your participation. Okay, thank you. That's great news. Um, Bonashay, should I move to the next the administrative calendar then? Uh, yes, but I think Catherine has a comment or a question. It was really just a question that could be answered. I just, is there a schedule for 
when committees meet. Oh, that's the ne very next item, Catherine. Oh, excellent, thank you. <laughs> I thought there was somewhere, but I couldn't recall. Sorry, it's a little clunky because um, it wouldn't fit in my PowerPoint. So um, can you see my, this, the, the, this, the yes. meeting here? So a staff, we took a stab at, at doing the 2021 calendars and there are a, a variety of kind of factors that go into play. First, when the applications, we, we, we start with when the IELTS and EF application is due because that's our kind of, you know, uh, our main grant and we build around that. Um, and then there are limitations um, such as um, we, we stay clear of uh, board of trustees meetings, um, uh, one year we accidentally had the due date on, um, for IELTS and EF on tax. So, so there, there's just a lot of <laughs> complications and, and, and challenges in, in doing um, the, 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 uh, the, the calendar. So we, we take a first stab. We want to share it with you. Um, if you can let us know, um, and, and I can, uh, this is including the meeting materials, but I can email this out specifically um, today. And if you can look at your calendar and let us know if you already have blackout dates for 2021, um, because if you are, we'll see if there's a quorum issue for any of these meeting dates. And then we'll send out a doodle pool if there are um, a to, to, to get a different date for um, the committee and the commission. I, I wanna note though at the commission level, um, there are four standing meetings for the commission. Um, they happen, you know, on average quarterly. Um, the, the ones that are very, very important um, are um, this uh, June, August, and 11th. February is, is a, a very much a planning meeting for us. It's not that it's not important, but um, it's we really, really need quorum at these last three. And generally, um, the commission meetings happen on a Friday. Um, but for the November meeting, I want to point out that it's on a Wednesday. So please, please, please check your calendars. I know um, with the judges on the commissions, um, sometimes they have um, uh, not availability in the middle of the week. So if that's the case, um, please let us know. And perhaps we can try to move around that date. But that, that time of year is just very hard. We usually like to have it the Friday before um, uh, before um, Thanksgiving because it provides us the maximum amount of review for IELTS and EEF. Um, but, but this one, um, there are certain complications that this was kind of the latest date that it could happen. So we can move it up if the 17th doesn't work, but that would mean that it would cut into the review period and would be very hard for us. So we'd like to keep the 17th date if possible, but, but I did want to highlight that that's on a Wednesday and not a Friday. And then here are the rest of the um, uh, committee meetings. <laughs> So I'll give everybody a kind of a, a, a couple of days to respond to me. If I don't hear anything um, by, let's say, Tuesday of next week, um, then then we'll assume that these meeting dates work. And then um, Kim and Vicky, who um, are in charge of the administration of our meetings, will then start to send out Outlook calendar invites. So it's all in your calendar. And if you want, and if it's easier for you, we're happy to make a tailored spread uh, sheet of just your committee dates. So say, um, Herman, um, I know you're on several committees. If you wanted one for just your meeting dates, we can put together, work with you, whatever is easy. Uh, if you have an assistant that you'd like us to work with because you, uh, you don't take um, Outlook calendar, we're happy to do that. So what, whatever is easiest for you to get it on your calendar, um, we, we can work with you. And I think this might be a good time to also um, highlight, you know, in these conversations that we've been having, as Duan said, we're making our way um, in having conversations with, with everyone on the commission. Uh, you'll, you'll note that one of the feedbacks that we've received from a few commission members is that these long meeting days of starting at 10 a.m. and ending at four when they're back to back, it's just getting really challenging for folks on a Zoom call. So what, what's been done, you'll see is that, you know, they've been broken up. So there'll be a the, the, the subcommittee meeting and then the commission meeting on separate days. What that, that will then translate to are, what will obviously, it'll show like you have more meetings to attend. So if that then becomes an issue, please give us a feedback and we could, you know, we could look at that. But really what the staff is trying to do um, and what we're trying to do is to make sure that, that it's not um, too burdensome for the commission members, because we've been hearing that, you know, especially this last year, it was it was task, you know, task intensive. So um, Pamela Bennett is uh, thanking you all for the calendar in advance, and Eric has a, a comment to make that I think is important if you want to 
highlight that? Yeah, just just to follow, uh, Duan had said that it's important to have quorum at the uh, um, June, August, and November meetings. But remember, this particular February, we may be setting expectations about the 2021 carryovers uh, and also expectations regarding the timeline for 2021 applications. So, yeah, you know, put a star by that one as well. That's a good point. You're right, Eric. Yeah. So they're, they're all, all four meetings. <laughs> we have a quorum. Um, and, and I just want to give a little background why the, the, why the meetings are typically stacked. Because when we have them in person, we, had, we received the feedback that if you're already coming to the state bar, we want to come just in the morning for the committee meeting. Now that we're on Zoom and we're remote, it, it, it doesn't, it, we don't need to be on the same day. I know everybody's tired. Um, the Kim has been the third meeting that she's in today. Um, you know, so it, it, we, we, we understand and we feel the same um, uh, kind of exhaustion. So that's why we're, we're separating the meeting. But again, it will mean that you're meeting on, on more days um, than not. So, so let us know if that works. Again, it's us taking a first stab at the, the calendar. If it doesn't and you don't have quorum, uh, we won't have quorum for a meeting. We'll set out a doodle pool. Um, and if you can't come to a meeting, that's fine. We still might have quorum and we, we may just have to move ahead um, without you. Um, and while we're on kind of the, the discussion of administration, Bonashe really wanted to open out, um, open it up now um, to kind of get feedback generally on uh, a, a commission administration. Um, we, we, we recognize that there's been a lot, a lot, a lot of work um, for commissioners that we've been asking a lot of you, um, reviewing a lot of materials, um, voting on a lot of items, um, attending more ad hoc meetings, and, and so, we know that's a strain. We know that this is not your day job and, and we really appreciate it. And we want thoughts on how um, to make it less burdensome for you. I have some kind of big out, out of the box ideas that maybe um, will be better saved for codification, but, but it's really a, a bigger question of, um, I think we as a commission and the staff should start to think about what you want your role as commissioners to be and what the staff role should be. Um, I, I know it got a little bit reset in 2018 with Appendix I, and it feels like we have a lot more processes. Um, it doesn't have to stay that way if, if, if you don't think it should. And we have an opportunity with codification to really, um, uh, you know, uh, clarify our roles and expectations in that what you think the commission should be and your oversight responsibility and what you think the staff responsibility should be to make this really more workable for both the commission and staff. Because we recognize that there's just a lot more processes that have been added since 2018. And, and I think this pendulum really swung the other way and it doesn't need to go that far. And so um, if you have initial feedback, um, we welcome them now, we welcome them after or through codification. But we wanted to take a moment to kind of recognize that the work has, has increased substantially. I think Rich is, just moved towards his camera. We just saw, <laughs> please I go ahead. To, Yeah, thanks. I, I wanted to just mention to people that at the stakeholders uh, uh, group meetings that many of you attended, one of the suggestions was made to, uh, to reduce the size of the commission. And I think that what's happened since the, that stakeholders group meeting, the series of five of them, is that the workload has increased. Uh, and um, in, in part to Herman's point, I, I think that the, any move by the trustees to reduce the size of the commission would put too great a burden on the surviving commission members. And if anything, we could use more representation of non-lawyers and lawyers on the commission. Uh, so I, I hope there is not a renewed movement on the part of the trust to reduce the size of this commission, given the workload. And I'm going to have to go. Yeah, just to add Thank to Rich, you, Rich. I, I think the original suggestion was to get rid of the commission, have it all done by the staff, and then the consultant came up with a great idea. The commission didn't need to be any larger than eight people. Mm -hmm. So think of the workload then. I I had one initial thought. Um, I thought staff's work um, during the partnership grants process was excellent. And that we, we didn't need to review as in detailed as we did on some of those. This, this is a, my personal opinion. Um, but that doing the double check was really useful. And I think areas like that where we can say, staff, we trust you. It's great. Um, let's, 
we'll, we'll do a double check very quickly and then moving on. Those are areas where I think reducing workload might make a lot of sense. I, I agree with what William is saying. Uh, I've been on the commission for a while. Can't believe it's close to a decade. I have seen a change and the change has been that um, we have taken on more decision-making responsibility in areas where I believe staff is better equipped because they are really in the weeds. Um, the uh, production, the preparation and production of materials to educate us so we feel really informed, I think in many areas is sufficient. Um, and so I think we all rely on the work of the staff and that in many instances, they can make a decision and you know, finding the dividing line on that, I think is a little bit different, but I think we might do a look back on how the dis decision-making was a number of years ago as a point uh, to start on our analysis of sort of where, where, where the dividing line might be. Um, I'm really cognizant of the amount of work that the staff does, the amount of paper that is produced um, the only thing that I want to suggest, but given the workload of the staff, I'm not sure it's possible for me, managing the amount of emails that come in on three different committees, it, it gets really difficult. And so I would prefer fewer emails with more stuff in them. But given the workload, and I've discussed with this with Duan, um, given the workload, I'm not sure that's possible. Uh, one thing that might make it more possible is if the notice period of putting out the materials could be shortened slightly. But I don't know if that is statutory, something that's up for codification. Um, but that's something I think maybe we could think about. It's not statutory. It was at the request of this commission. Yeah, um, I know. Yeah, okay, okay. All right. <laughs> guilty, you know, we're guilty. <laughs> it was your request to have meeting materials seven days in advance. The state yeah. bar kind of best practice, it's not a firm rule, is to have um, the board of trustees gets their meeting materials five days. That's that's our, you know, we have to notice the agenda 10 days and there's state bar um, pseudo policy that five days. So we used to provide you meeting materials within five days, but your request was to move it to seven days. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm not, this is, I've said this before, it has caused a hardship for staff and we have to had to work over the weekends because of it. With that said, we understand we have heavy meeting materials. So we do try to the extent possible to respect your request of seven days, because we know there's a lot of meeting materials to provide it when we can. Um, so you have advance notice, but, 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 for instance, the, the, the spreadsheets that were provided for this meeting for carryover and budget requests, um, you know, we could not get it to you that Friday before. We had to get it to you the Monday, and that was half the staff working on the weekend. So mm -hmm. if we moved it to later, you're going to get meeting materials later. So this is one of those things I, I don't know because you all voted and wanted meeting materials seven days in advance, and and I'm trying. we're trying to accommodate that. We just can't always. So if we move back, I mean, we just... We just need to know as staff, are, is everybody comfortable with that? I know Kim has suggested that before, but this commission has explicitly said seven days. So I, I recall the seven days was last year because of the um, some of the program issues that we were looking at and that we were taking into um, executive committee discussions. So it was trying to get in, get as much material as fast as we could um, timely so that we could review it and then be able to uh, discuss it in those in those um, those meetings and that's really where the seven day kind of thought came from but I think this conversation is to, to kind of recalibrate and see what will what will serve not only the staff but the commission um, and this conversation that Duane and I are having with you all is really 
just to let you know, we've, we've heard you through those calls that we've been having. Um, and that we're, you know, we're reading the emails that you guys are sending. So uh, maybe this is a, a discussion definitely for um, codification as you guys, as you've uh, pointed to Duan. Um, and if you guys could keep giving us more of your insights and your thoughts um, and your feedback, and we'll continue to see how we could best um, make this, you know, as, as palatable as possible, especially given what we're facing the year ahead. And, and I'm always cognizant of, you know, as we're balancing the, the, the impact on the commission members, you know, I, I, I'm always thinking about how do we balance the impact on the staff because it's multiples um, in terms of what they're dealing with. So. So I, I know we need to move along, but Duan, I'm not, I mean, uh, Bonashe, I'm not sure we want to delay like receiving, this, receiving yeah, to a codification um, given the burden that everybody's feeling and whether well, this, this could be something that we bring, bring into forward. Yeah. yeah, this could be something I just saw Eric's hand go up to. This could be something we could bring into the executive committee meeting um, and see what 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 we come up with, and then bring it back to the full commission, and they could, you guys can guide us on on how best it would serve everyone. Yeah, meeting materials doesn't need to be decided at codification. I meant for codification more of the larger meta um, question of right, right, and staff right. But meeting materials, yeah, I think we can just decide amongst us and uh, well, perhaps with at XCOM and we'll bring back a, a you know, uh, because the flip side, Kim, was, you know, when all that was happening with um, some of the compliance issue with programs is that um, commissioners said there's so much, if they're yes. ready, to send them to us piecemeal. And so we have been sending it to you in piecemeal, but we really realize it's been um, an overload. It's your explosion in your inbox. So uh, trying to find that the right balance. A balance, yeah. 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 Eric, you had something? Uh, a brief comment. Um, the materials uh, are, are generally very good. Uh, they're lengthy, though, and they often have quite a bit of background material. And I'm wondering, I'm just going to say out loud, I, I don't have a quick solution for this, but if there's a way that we could strive to maybe shorten the memos and relegate some of the background material to appendices so we could maybe just kind of get to the point more quickly in terms of the decisions that have to be made and, you know, um, anyway, we, we agree. And, and, and Andrea has also um, picked up on that too. And she, that's one of the things that she will be working with staff to, um, to try to streamline. I agree with that generally, with the exception of eligibility conferences. And I think that that's why we didn't have appeals this year, because we papered it up um, pretty well. So I would, I would agree with the exception of that. And that's something that I still want us to have very fleshed out memo with a lot of background for programs that we, we go towards not funding. But I think for everything else, carry over and budget modification, I don't think you need all that, that background. Very short, get to the point, give you the spreadsheet, you can review the substance. I had one small remark, just that I, uh, we don't have insight into the staff uh, working all of those hours. Unfortunately, we don't get to see it. So any way that we can have more transparency or some sort of feedback mechanism both ways, I would love that because uh, obviously I don't want to abuse your time as staff or any of my fellow commission members. I think that's really important. I don't know how to do that, but I think it would be great. And, and we're making a, you know, we're short staffed and I think that's why we're, we're feeling a little overstretched, but um, we made a commitment and Andrea has made a commitment that we all want to get back to a 40 hour work week for everybody in this office. Yeah, I just want to re-emphasize that. I don't know if you caught it over the children screaming, but um, that, uh, you know, we, we have been understaffed and, um, you know, not myself, I'm very new, but the staff here has, I think, really just gone above and beyond because they really care about the work. Um, to make sure all of these important things are moving forward. But, um, you know, I appreciate the commission's support and understanding for wanting to get to a place where we can have more balance for our staff. And I think some of that 
is looking at the length of certain work product. I think some of it is getting fully staffed, which has been a big priority for me. Um, and revisiting some of these things about how many days in advance we give materials. So those are all things we're looking at. So this feedback is very timely. Um, and please, you know, continue to share thoughts about how we can be uh, more efficient with all of these processes, because um, they're very welcome. Great, great. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the time. I don't want to, this is a, a, an important conversation, but I also want to make sure that we get everything completed on this agenda. So if there's nothing else um, in terms of comments or questions related to, I, we're, I think we've, we've exhausted um, 2021 administrative activities. Yes, Duan? Yes, yes. Okay. And just so All right. briefly, uh, we have Unfortunately, this isn't our last meeting of the year. We have a December 15th meeting that um, we would really need quorum because we have to approve HP grants. Um, so let us know if you're, um, if you know now that you're not available. Great, great, thank you. Uh, all right, uh, let's move forward with liaison reports. Selena. Hi all, um, nothing really to report other than what we've been um, talking about at this meeting. Um, I think a few folks, including the um, liaison from COAF mentioned that there's gonna be a diversity summit coming up pretty soon. So that's in partnership with uh, the Office of Access and Inclusion and with LAC, that's gonna be on December 11th. Um, and I, I'm really looking forward to it. And I sent a couple emails <laughs> just today and we're organizing panelists still. Um, and of course, as, as you know, we've been working with the legislature to increase funding for legal services. And I think we may have some ideas moving into next year um, specifically around the becoming eviction cliff or eviction wave. Um, we're also working with, with legislators about an extension of AB 3088 to extend those um, the eviction moratorium in some way, um, which is one of the reasons why we think that this, this wave may come over time because perhaps there'll be some additional protections for certain individuals, um, hopefully. And um, we just continue to work on all sorts of efforts to increase funding for legal services. Uh, Lauren Klein in our office is, is quite busy working with State Bar staff and with, with other um, government entities on opening up federal and um, state funding for legal services now. So if there's existing state safety net services, including service funding through federal relief packages, you know, can we open up, open up some of the funding for safety services to legal services as part of the bigger picture? Um, so that, those are our big updates. We continue to work on funding, continue to work on um, um, really investigating the diversity of the legal aid uh, community and what we can do with our recommendations to improve that and also just helping to keep people connected. Um, for those of you who work with legal aid attorneys, we, we have a, um, a monthly wellness summit that we've been doing, um, which we know everyone's getting burned out. Um, everyone's overwhelmed, overloaded. Half of us may have you know, children or pets or someone else in the household who's make, who makes it hard to work. Um, so we're really looking for ways to help support our community. Um, but that's, that's on my report. Thank you, Selena. Thank you. Bonnie? Um, hi, thanks. So the uh, Chief Justice and um, the Director Martin Hoshino, Administrative Director of the Courts, have been meeting with legal services folks, and I think Selena, or folks from LAC, um, to discuss some of the access issues that have really become much more challenging as a result of COVID, and I really appreciate um, that participation by legal services folks to make sure that um, everybody knows what's going on in different, you know, throughout the state, because of course there are enormous differences in terms of um, access and, and options, but um, we all want to really move forward. The um, cost, the Judicial Council will be submitting a cost benefit analysis on self-help centers uh, to the legislature at the end of November. And one of the things that we did for that is um, developed a, a customer satisfaction tool for self-help centers that um, I think we're going to suggest that the partnership grant folks use because we have, uh, we had 6,800 people fill those out in four days. Um, so we have a nice sort of basis of comparison and it, it you know, seemed like a pretty easy, straightforward tool for people to use. Um, so that we can, you know, start thinking about that evaluation and having some comparability of data. So we'll be, you know, really looking forward to working with the commission too on expanding courts that might be uh, the opportunity to have more partnership grant applications um, 
between the courts and legal services. And I think that's it. Oh, and I'll just say Shriver, uh, the Shriver new series of grants has started in October and we are working on also upgrading and updating uh, some of the tools for that project. So we're kind of in evaluation mode. Great, thank you, Bonnie. Um, Will had a question, Selena, I think responded. Will, are you, are you satisfied with that response? Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, it answers the question. I, I'm not sure why it would make them nervous, but thank you. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to answer orally for the benefit of those on the phone. Um, we'll ask, um, you know, is there any talk thank about- Thank you, Selena. Right, is there any talk about right to counsel in unlawful detainers, uh, legislative efforts? And my answer is yes. Although um, sometimes we talk about just increased funding because if you say right to counsel, sometimes it feels like an unfunded mandate. And so people can get a little nervous about saying right to counsel and how expansive that would be. And what if someone who's wealthy is evicted from a business? And so um, you, in order to really talk about helping people, we talk about what funding is needed to really have universal representation. Um, and so we, we all, it's, an, it's a name game. We're always trying to figure out what's the best phrasing to be, um, to be helpful um, to the issue, which we all wanna have increased funding for, for folks, whether it's, um, full scope representation or whether it's just helping folks understand their rights and doing tenant education. There's a whole spectrum of services depending on the, the individual's needs. But yes, the work is being done. Very good, thank you. All right, um, if there's nothing, is this, this completes the agenda for today, yes? All right, another uh, flavorful uh, meeting with all of you wonderful people. Uh, thank you again, honestly, uh, every commission member, every liaison, every staff member, everyone who uh, puts in their heart and their soul into this work. Um, it, it's, it's a privilege to do this work with, with all of you. So thank you guys. Uh, Bob, this is your time to uh, move to adjourn. <laughs> it's all moved. <laughs> My <Great>. acclamation. <laughs> and do I have a second? You have a third and a fourth and a fifth. <laughs> Brilliant. I think Zahir is seconded. All right. See you guys in December. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent.